everybody to another episode of the Break the Rules stream. I am Left Polyakov at Left Po on Twitter, coming at you all the way live. This is going to be one for the uh, one to remember, definitely. We are going to be talking about Christianity. We are here with Neil Nasik and Formand. We are joined back by Tyler Hamilton, of course, Giovanni Penacchetti. New camera angle, don't worry about it. Uh, as uh, Gio likes to say, so we're just going to get into this thing. I am very excited that Gio's Fez is on, first of all, but I'm also very excited to tell all of you good people that my emphasis for the stream today is on likes, meaning you guys have to start dropping in more likes. The more likes you guys drop in, the better the algorithm is going to reward this uh, stream so that many people will get to see it. So there we go. Thank you for liking the video and keep liking and of course keep subscribing. Patreon.com slash break the rules. So let us start with uh, Tyler. First of all, for those who do not know who you are, give a brief intro and then I would love to get Gnostic's brief intro for the people on Tyler's side, and then we could get into it. Cool. Well, I guess I'll give a condensed version of the intro I gave last time, but I'm known for a show called EBL, which was me, Joel Davis, uh, occasionally Keith, uh, Doris, Jefferson, and Josh. And basically what we did was we went through different texts in the history of philosophy, broke them down for the audience, and then determined to them what the practical relevance is for thinking about politics today. Um, what I'm mostly known for now is a show called Theopolitics, which is a theological deconstruction of secular metaphysics and modernity and the various uh, foundations that make up practical secular disciplines like sociology, political science, and all the like, and exposing their secular and, the and uh, heretical and often pagan sources that go behind these apparently secular disciplines and then in their place putting up a Christian response to politics. So th those are the two things. Other than that, I'm also known for ECL, which is a film analysis uh, show, and um, Interventions, which is more political analysis, day-to-day -day event kind of stuff, although that's currently on hiatus, but it'll be revived soon. Excellent. And uh, Neil, give us a brief intro for yourself as well, buddy. Yeah, I host a channel called Gnostic Informant. It is about history, mythology, comparative religion, philosophy, psychedelics, a little bit of science. And I like to uh, like to learn about the ancient world and ancient religions, what people believed in early Christianity, Gnosticism, all that stuff. I bring on different scholars from different from different fields of knowledge and explore their expertise and ask the hard, the tough questions and try, try to stay. This is impossible, by the way, try to stay with, without my bias and try to look at things in the past without starting from point a and trying to get back to point a but actually trying to find learn new information and get somewhere else that i didn't think i was going to go if that makes sense that's the that, whole goal. that uh does make sense and i'm going to bring geo back in here i'm not sure what happened to him he's adjusting oh all right oh, back back, back to the old uh, camera it takes a while for the my computer to reboot yeah it happens so because i'm not on my new computer that's why it sucks because i have the kino background my old one so mm, yeah. no problem so getting to the core of this tyler had a couple of bones to pick with some of uh, gnostic informants views in the last stream and what i decided to do that is a great cup by the way what i decided to do is to break down those specific topics so we could just go one after the other and see what's uh, crack a lack in there so the topics i'm just going to uh, read them right now and once again everybody give a like right now like this video i cannot stress enough give a like how much... give send go more like yes. uh griff send scam glow and <laughs> and click the bell that's the other one poor bell the poor bell has been ignored for too long click that bell right now you know you want to you know you need to you know you need to anyway this is the breakdown of the uh, conversation the wine in the Dionysian ceremonies compared to the Eucharist. Number two, Christian non-resistance, turning one's cheek, give the clothing on your back, carry the bag an extra mile, etc. And lastly, the dying and rising God-man comparison to the pagan gods. So there you have it. We are going to start from the wine. And I would love for Tyler uh, to uh, say again what you said in the uh, last uh, stream about that. And then Gnostic will respond and we'll have a little conversation and then move on to the next one. Well, well, before that, Lev, uh, 
some McGee said you have a graphic here now on the screen. I do have a graphic, and the graphic tells people that they have to like and click the bell. Better oh my it. god! <laughs> yeah. Like this oh, video yeah. and share it to your Facebook. Oh my god! I saw it. Holy crap! <laughs> we'll go straight to it. <laughs> sorry, Taylor, I'm very sorry for my friend. It's not. It's not oh. getting in the way of the chat though, because the chat takes uh, so much of the screen that it's just yeah. like on the upper portion. It's fine. Go with it. It's a hyper real nightmare, like that <laughs> street video. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, Tyler, go ahead, buddy. Right. So I get in brief what I said, there's quite a bit more I could say about this. But what I mentioned was on the subject of Dionysus and the comparison with the Eucharist, which was came up in Gnostic Informant and James were discussing uh, comparisons to the Christian Eucharist and trying to say that there's a, a similarity between the two that emphasizes or can lend credence to some kind of borrowing of the Christians from the Dionysus rituals in order to then appeal and create a religion which would make the Jews more formidable to Roman rule and less prone to uh, revolt, as was kind of common in that time period during Second Temple Judaism and later. And what I said was, what, what, what I noticed in the talk, and again, to their credit, it was quite brief, so it's not like I was going after the whole bulk of what they said in that regard. It was like a throwaway sentence, but they said that, you know, when you're imbibing and you're taking in the wine, you're taking in Dionysus, and then in the context of doing this, you're also there's some note, and I think actually James is the one who said this, that you are being free from sin when you take in Dionysus and that you're being saved from sin. Now, what I said in two comments in relation to this was that in the Dionysian ritual, as quoted by Euripides and the Bacchus, he actually describes it as a libation ritual, which was quite common to actually a lot of the Greek cults around that time, where the libation, the god, was actually poured out as an offering, and then afterwards, a con consummation of the wine followed over which was more of a which was more of a ritual that was related to alternate states of consciousness and transcending social barriers and uprooting of various roles there's kind of a trance ritual but in the, the case is there's very little comparison between the two one as i said it's not actually ingested in the first place and if you actually read the inscriptions there they're donated to zeus the savior is actually who you, who you actually bless onto the cup of the wine that's then poured out and then um in that sense, what you have is a similarity which is only merely ritual in the sense that it's not related to the Eucharist in the sense of trying to go over salvation from original sin. Rather, it's an alternate state of consciousness which has simply no relation to the Christian Eucharist. So that's what I said in those two comments. But yeah. Oh, okay. okay. First of all, you think that they don't drink the wine at all? No, I actually just said at first they pour it out as a libation. Now, some, some of the earlier versions, descriptions of that basically say that that originated because Dionysus was said to give the wine to them, right? He was a benefactor god. He gave them to the wine. He gave them the wine. And then so what you then find later on early in linguistic usage is that there's an identification with Dionysus and the wine so much that early kind of naturalistic accounts of Dionysus say that he was the wine itself in the linguistic sense yeah. but that is a that is a comparison which is drawn from an earlier account which is trying to say that the development of the Dionysian ritual and the discovery of wine comes about through Dionysus being directly identified with the wine but then later on that becomes standardized in the sense that you as you are thanking him you're giving the sacrifice you're pouring it out as a libation first and then afterwards you have a kind of sharing wine and a ritualistic uprooting of barriers which comes about through drunkenness essentially and the reason that's chosen is because wine and drunkenness is very paradoxical which is kind of in line with the chaos of Dionys Dionysus in the first place yeah um so I don't disagree with you that much because I don't think they're exactly copying the Eucharist or I don't think they're copying Dionysus in the Eucharist that's not that's not what I think I'm not sure what James said but um, the, for, for my argument is that the motif is there, and if you're if you're a Hellenized, let's say someone from Ephesus in the first century, and this Eucharist is being shown to you uh, as this new Christian thing, right? You're you're going to right away think of the Bacchic rituals of Bacchanalia. This is going to be the the motif is going to be um, quite. Uh, What's the word? It's going to be quite easy to pick up on 
in the sense of this is something that's been happening for going back to the time of Herodotus, where he talks about this in like 450 BC. This is going on for centuries. This Bacchanalia, the um, the uh, initiation of is also the Illusionian mysteries. You would drink the wine and believe in that Persephone would rise, raise you from the dead when she um, resurrects. This is another thing that was prevalent in the Roman imperial cult at the time. Um, so my thing is this. So the word Baca, Bacchus is actually a, uh, comes from the root word Bacoy, which is an, a word for a vine, a grapevine. And a, a Bac, I think it's Bac, Bacom, or Bac, one, it's, has, it has the word Bac in it. Also has the word, another word for grape or a, a type of fruit that comes off a vine. So when, you, when, when, you re, when you're reading the text of John, I think it's John 5, where he says, I am the, I am the true vine. Your the audience that's reading this is going to think in in terms of this is like Dionysus. This is going to be uh, very similar, very. Uh, it, it's going to ring a bell, if that makes sense. So. The, so what do I mean by this? When a when a fortune teller is trying to, to tell someone's fortune, what they do, they often what they often do is they'll get information on this person find out something about their grandma the grandma like the color red they figured this out okay we got information on them oh yeah i'm seeing the color red oh yeah i see this and they're like oh that's my grandma and all what they're doing is they're trying to trying to strike emotions with the people that they're trying to sell this idea to now I'm not, not my saying this is all about bacchus no i i personally believe that jesus in the especially in the gospel of john is being presented as a world messiah. So John, the John 5 that has to do with him being the vine, I think they're playing towards the audience in Athens who are worshipers of Bacchus. But I also think there's other parts in, in the text where they might be doing doing playing off Odysseus or Aeneas or but it, like like we all know this, the the the, the old the old testament, the uh, Torah, they're they're drawing from these characters like Noah. They're drawing from Joseph being sold for 20 shekels. They're drawing. This is happening throughout the text, but it's, for me, it's not just the Old Testament like Christians think. This is also playing off other myths in the ancient world. Um, for example, you got, well, we can, we can get into this when we talk about dying and rising gods, but I, I do want to focus on these, the, the Bacchus thing. And um, the, this is the big question that I have toward to you to respond to this, because if, if you're right and I'm wrong, then the question is, where does this come from? Okay, we get it from the text, right? We get it from Jesus offering up his blood, saying, drink my blood, eat my flesh. But this is the thing. If this was just for a Jewish audience, this would be blasphemous to them. This is not kosher at all. There's actually laws in Deuteronomy that say, first of all, wine's not kosher. Wine itself is not kosher. But drinking blood of someone else in, in an offering, that is a completely uh, pagan Ritual. So I, I want to know what you think about where it actually comes from and who they're do. What is this for? What's the reason why they would do this if they're just Jews? It's not kosher. Oh, it was. <laughs> love you. Do the voice. You do. <laughs> I've never been able to do a good voice of like the Jewish impression. Oh, get out of here. Um, I one one more thing before we move on. I, I do want to say that um, if uh, well, Tyler will answer, but also want to ask Nostin Foreman if. Jesus is the a compilation of uh, ancient sources. Then why is it that there are so many literary motifs throughout the Bible that equate Jesus with various, both natural forces and animalistic forces? Jesus is the Lamb of God. Uh, he's akin to water. Of course, water is a very powerful motif in all world religions, practically. Um, so I wonder what is the impetus to create such a vast compilation and collage? It's almost as if in that case, Christ would be the first, I don't know, postmodern, eclectic um, entity, I guess, in terms of mythology. But that's, well, we'll get to that. But Tyler, please, my friend, you have the floor. Yeah, I'll talk about that. Right. Well, the first thing I would say about this is, on the one hand, we're reading the later Christian community. We're reading the, reading the spread of the Gospels and who they're preaching to. It is true that it's actually a primarily a missionary religion to the Gentiles, because the whole point of the Gospels is the fulfillment of the covenant to Israel, which, again, is in some ways meant to be unanticipated to what they actually expected, at least from the period of Second Temple Judaism. So that there is what happens in early Christianity, including persecution by Judaic churches on Christians, which happens in AD 80 up to AD 150. 
where there are what you're talking about, this kind of, well, you know, Jesus can't be the Messiah because what we're supposed to have is the general resurrection of all believers, right? But the, the continuity, rather than a God coming up on earth, dying, and then him himself resurrecting, that's something they didn't anticipate. But the continuity is merely on the kind of symbols of the fulfillment of the covenant to Israel. And then the, after that, the primary mission missionary work to the Gentiles, right? So what I'm getting at is when it comes to Christ being the blood, right, and the body into the, the wine and the bread, is I don't see a similar motive here with Dionysus. Or as if they're trying to appeal to Dionysian followers, simply because the store, the kind of what we find in the Eucharist is incredibly different from what Dionysian followers were actually focusing on. I mean, we could say the wine, for example, okay, they both have wine, but that's really about it, right? The fact is, I mean, we're talking about the ancient world. There's basically a tiny amount of drinks you could choose from in your religious ritual, right? There wasn't soda machines or anything. Right. So you had water, you had wine, and water was often contaminated, which is why they weren't used in religious rituals. So I think trying to draw a similarity simply because of a universal, which is the fact that religious rituals at the time involved certain kinds of meals, in this case it would be wine, doesn't get to the heart of the question, which is on the difference between Dionysus and Jesus, and whether or not that would actually work as like, okay, well now, oh, Jesus is a lot like this Dionysus guy. We can get behind that. But that again, ties back to the point I was saying earlier is that in a Dionysian ritual, what you have is trying to bring about an altered state of consciousness and an uprooting of various social roles, which is supposed to be paradoxical, right? This is why drunkenness goes along with, with um, the Dionysian ritual, which is markedly different from what they're trying to get about in the gospels with Jesus. And so another thing I'll say on that though, is the kind of view you're pushing forward of Dionysus does go back to a lot of earlier religious studies where they try to say that there's a sacramentalism in Dionysus that is continuous with the Christian one. But I mean, if you look at the older, much older prehistoric um, um, cannibalistic practices, which is something you find in the earlier Dionysian cults, although by the time you get to the classical periods, they basically get rid of cannibalism and human sacrifice. But you had the communal tearing apart of an animal, eating of its raw flesh. Yep. And that goes back to Pentheus being torn limb from limb, but although he's not actually eaten by Dionysus followers, and then you also have the Maniads that eat their own children. And so what we have, at least up until the late Hellenistic period, is the practice of eating of raw, fresh, raw flesh. And we know that from various inscriptional evidence. So what I'm trying to get at here, though, though, is that a lot of the more recent scholarly work on Dionysus, people like, um, uh, what's his name? In the book, uh, I actually sent this to Lev earlier when he asked me about it, but D. Oblink in, what's the name of that damn book? I just had it here. The uh, Mask of uh, yeah. Dionysus. <laughs> the Mask of Dionysus, yeah. It, it goes through basically refuting the idea that the old, the animals that are associated with imbuing Dionysus' power is actually something that was largely inferred on the basis later of trying to reinterpret Christian sacramentalism back onto the history of ritual and myth, which is something that scholars no longer hold to. So, and that's what I'm getting across is the purpose is so different. And the only thing we have in common is essentially a universal, which mm. is the use of wine. There, there is also a quotation. No, there's a lot more than that. A lot well, more than that. Before that, I just want to say that there is a quotation from the Mask of Dionysus book, which I looked up today, uh, which says that Dionysus continues to be regarded as a forerunner of Christ, both in terms of sacramentalism and anthropomorphism. To it's drink awesome. wine in the rites of Dionysus is to commune with the god and take his power and physical presence into one's body. Euripides' popular depiction of the god anticipated the Christian concept of Christ as God incarnate in human form. Form. Um, let me explore that. Sure, first. sure. Pause that because Euripides Bacchae de depicts the, Euripides depicts this Dionysus. The first opening sentence of Book One in this play is the the Son of God has entered the world. Okay, that's like the the image. We're, we're talking when, I, when I'm talking about the comparisons. I'm not talking about what it meant when they drank the wine or what with this what the actual meat. What I'm talking the differences are what we actually should focus on more is because. There, there's an archetype here, right? Dionysus being the son of God, this prince of heaven, the heir, the logos. He's actually called the logos in several ancient sources. Um, Herodotus, Plutarch, uh, there's a couple of, a couple other ones where they actually call Dionysus. Osiris and Mithra, all the logos. These are all different characters of the logos. Um, the word of God, the 
the the air of divine heaven. The uh, and so what happens to Dionysus in the Bacchae is he's not believe they don't believe in him, so they deny him. And when he comes back in his glory, he they're all repenting, but he tells them it's too late. The the uh, the wages of sin are death. Now let's break this down for a second. Now think about think about this for a second. You got a guy who is the son of God who doesn't care about, he doesn't want you to do anything. He doesn't want you to establish a kingdom or anything. He doesn't want you to take over a city or he doesn't want you to, to write a book or follow any laws. All he wants is you to believe in him. And that's how you get your, your salvation. That is an archetype. This is a, a specific archetype that we see throughout the ancient world. Dionysus was, was, was like this. You have Amon as the father God, Dionysus being like this, air this continued air this also continued with horus when when osiris was was killed when he resurrects he comes back as his son horus um in the middle east you have uh ishtar ishtar and tammuz tammuz is literally described as the anointed one and he dies and gets saved by ishtar and it, when when they raise him up with all the dead it's springtime so this is happening on the spring equinox which is easter Okay, so that's another topic: dying and rising. Right, God. right. But I'm yes. with dying, dying. the only reason why I'm bringing Christ compelled. The only reason why I'm bringing that up. Is, hey, let me just finish this thought real quick. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The only reason why I'm bringing that up is because I'm trying to demonstrate how the Dionysus has this archetype of the Son of God figure, and when Jesus comes around in the first second first second century, middle of the second century, when he's getting real popular, third century. They're looking at this as a real, a real Dionysus. They're, they're all like, eh, you know, he's, he's, he's written about in plays and it's not real. Jesus is real. He really did all this. This is exactly what the uh, Euripides and all these playwrights were trying to get at. And we have actual, the actual archetype of the son of man who is Jesus. So when they're writing the gospels, they're trying to play off all of these archetypes and not just i'm not saying it's just bacchus or it's just this jewish or it's just this it's all of this stuff right so all of that i can get to later but i want to stick with where we're supposed to be in the topic right now which is on dionysus now you said that in the baki that it calls him son of god this is actually not true what it actually says is that he um he veiled his godhead in a mortal shape in order to make it manifest to mortal men. And then he tells his disciples that that's why I've changed my immortal form and taken the first the sentence of the first first sentence says the son of God has entered the world. It's the first thing it says. I'm not sure where you're getting that. From. Let's <laughs> see. Let's see. We can look it up right now. Gnostic, do you have it in front of you? Do you have it on the screen? I have an English. No, but doesn't doesn't Christ compel people to action? Um, I forget in Mark, I think. Like, I there's like many. To... Go ahead, Tyler. I would like to finish my point, though. The, the yeah, titles of the Dionysus are Fireborn, Son of the Nymphs, Firstborn, which you could compare, except Firstborn is a common title of primacy. Well-fruited, um, teeming, bursting, various things associated with being a bull, an animal form, God of many forms. But anyways, so what I was saying, when he says that he, he veiled his Godhead in the mortal shape, that's why he's changed my mortal form and taken the likeness of man. Basically, a lot of people, what they do is they compare that to John and Paul describing describing Jesus as uh, the word made flesh and in the likeness of sinful flesh. But again, you have to understand Dionysus here in the Baki in context, because a part of the problem with this kind of parallel mania is you take these things out of context and try to apply them in a way that it would be applied to Jesus later on to make it feel like, okay, that's the same kind of thing. But no, the reason in the Baki that Dionysus fails his divinity and made himself manifest to men is so we can play a prank on the city of thieves and pentheus because they refuse to honor him right so he says i'll join that army of women possessed and lead them to battle and that's why i changed my divine form to human right so he says that he'll establish his rituals in order to make his godhead manifest to mortal men now here i don't see any kind of similarity to jesus well you just said it you just said it he he comes he comes to the world as a as a mortal first of all and he, he only wants you to believe in him, and that's it. That's Jesus. But but wait, does not Christ compel action in people in numerous instances, not just belief? I mean, that's a very, I would say, Protestant interpretation of. And that's that's what I mean. That's sort of what happens with the Bacchae, where uh, Bacchus actually compels uh, Pentheus to 
do certain things and mm. believe in certain or, or say certain things. Uh, Neil, right, what is the, what is the uh, book that uh, has this particular uh, transcription in it? I could just found, find the it. Son right of God has entered the world. The first sentence. The yes, Eur Euripides Bacchae. Euripides Bacchae. All right, first, I'm gonna yes. I'm first gonna look it up. up. All right. But so, yeah, no. Yeah. And look, I get what you're saying. I, I get where you can you can you can charge me with um, parallel mania for this. And I'm I'm not saying that we should be focused on all the little similarities. I think is when you take a, take a step back and look and see that there's a, there's a mo there's a common motif and there's an archetype of a sa a savior archetype who is a, a heir of the father god. I mean, it's very it, it it's actually very specific when you look at it from an archetypal standpoint. When you when you I mean, when you you're right. There's a lot of differences. There's they're completely different in so many ways. Well, well there, there's even Greek myths that you could say instantiates a sort of proto-christian ethic i mean i would argue that um not euripides uh what's the one with the brother that died oh, uh, antigone antigone probably you would have a, a basis for a lot of christ's ethics right there in terms of the relation between the law of the city and the law of, of uh, the divine so well again just go ahead tyler Okay, well, I was going to say, again, that this is trying to pluck them out of the context to make it sound like it's similar. What Dionysus in the play of the Bacchae is he's he's complaining about the fact that Pentheus refuses to honor him, and then he causes the woman to go mad, and he runs into the wilderness. And so what he's, his basic plan is to convince Pentheus to dress as a woman so he can sneak out and do some spying on the woman and the wilderness is a way to humiliate and destroy him. And then Pentheus ends up dead and torn to bits by a woman. Now, there's no sense of salvation in Dionysus in this story. What you do have, at least, is a kind of, um, a kind of, um, but that's if we're focusing on just that play. Outside of the Euripides, there's other plays and there's other texts that are attributed to Dionysus where he actually does offer salvation to people who believe in him. Where he well, is, he salvation, is. again, in the Dionysian cults, when you participate in these rituals, and which is actually very common to a lot of these kinds of religions, is that you engage in a practice which is supposed to put your soul into a kind of spiritual ecstasy, which is supposed to ease the transition from one this life to the next one, which, again, is quite different from any notion of bodily resurrection. Yeah. Um, in other words, if I, if I had Dionysian salvation, I would say uh, that's kind of a bum deal. Well, no, I, I agree with that. That's the difference between, and that's the, and that's the thing. When Christianity comes around, it, it offers a better, more co cohesive way of salvation than the, the the Roman the Roman imperial cult does with the with the mysteries, because the mysteries are sort of a bunch of different things tied together. So, this the the Mithraic mysteries could be could be connected to the Illusianian mysteries. But like like you said, it's just, it's not as coherently put together as Christianity is later on. This is why Christianity is able to easily take over compared to these small cults of Bacchus worshippers here. And one's in Macedonia, another one's in Syria, another one's in another Ephesus or so. They're not as connected together. They're not as as cohes co co coherent as what you have with the later church, where they have this all figured out. Better theology better philosophy, better everything. Well, yeah, I mean, we are better, but, <laughs> uh, no, I'm just but, uh, my, my issue with what you're saying though, and this, I would have to go a little off of Dionysus here is because it's not just a, a difference of degree in the sense that, you know, Christians figured this out. They gave us a better offer of salvation than what the mystery religions had on offer. What we know about the Greco Roman world, which is something I actually mentioned on the last stream is the whole notion of bodily resurrection was considered abhorrent like th that was something they outright rejected like it was not desirable now i can go into specifics about that if you want me to but it's it's a kind of unanticipatedness of the christian story which doesn't fit into either roman or even the jewish uh, attempt at hope for salvation right with israel so like i could go into like homer and plato and all that good stuff but it's not just a, a different kind of a better salvation. It's one that the Greco Roman world generally considered to be undesirable. In other cases, if it wasn't undesirable, then it was at least impossible. Yeah, and I, I do I do think it should be noted that Dionysus was connected to the Lusianian mystery in Rome. 
Um, and this goes back to like, you know, fourth century BC, where it, by ta- by becoming an initiate, you by believing that you had we're going to be raised up with Persephone. That was your and and, and your I know I know what you're thinking. What, what does it have to do with Dionysus? But Dionysus was tied to these mysteries, and his the, the actual wine aspect of these rituals was the Dionysus aspect. It's polytheistic, so it's playing on a bunch of different gods, but it's still trying to get to the salvation of one, of one individual, the initiate. Yeah, but there's a distinction here, though. I, I get what you're saying. I mean, but when it comes to the variety of mystery religions, and I mean, like Socrates knew about them, Aristophanes made fun of them. The distinction between the Platonic view and what the educated class in the Greco Roman world thought was the distinction between, look, we both think that the only kind of post mortem existence, and they take this over from Homer, right? Homer has a very gloomy view of the afterlife where people are essentially these phantoms and they're in a subhuman state. Yeah. Right. Actually, that's actually a very important thing I need to point out here is that they actually didn't consider the soul, the phantom, what we would now think of as like the whole spiritual part of a person. They actually thought of the soul as, as essentially a subhuman phantom state, not a full person. And so Plato comes around and he goes, okay, well, you know, like this is not going to produce good statesmanship, right? Or good citizenry if we have this kind of gibbering view of the afterlife. So the platonic view is essentially that, you know, the soul has to go to this place. It gets, uh, judged and goes to either the Isle of the Blessed or the Isle of Tartarus. But this is a kind of dispute you find played out among the followers of Plato and then also those in the mystery religions and also the those who hold the Homeric view, which we see in inscriptions and funerary rites all the way up through the regular Greco-Roman populace, is the distinction here is there's no notion of bodily resurrection. In fact, the word for it was anastasis. They explicitly denied it. Homer denied it. Plato denied it. Uh, Sorry, Senate- Jews. Now, so yeah, what the important thing is, though, is in those panoply of options, whether we're talking about the Stoics, uh, the Ep- Epicureans, the Platonists, all the likes, the mystery religions, it was all about, in the case of the mystery religions, the soul through ecstatic union, and he would bypass the intellectual realm. This is why the philosophers hated the mystery religions. And then they would have essentially this kind of pre-ecstatic state, which would carry over the soul into the afterlife. By the way, uh, gentlemen, I have over here, a uh, passage from the uh, Bache where it says over here, this is the uh, strophe one. It's the uh, third section. Run, Bache, run, Bache. Bring the god, the son of a god, thunder Dionysus. Now, I've seen son of a god being referred to son of Zeus in other translations. This one says son of a god, but not son of the god. But this is what I have. No, but but wait, Tyler, you were saying that the Greek view of the soul is not of a complete person, but rather it is a, let's call it um, an affect of the person rather than the totality of a person. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Oh, that- wow. Then that kind of yeah. explains that. It, like it, it makes the Nietzschean view of the Greeks a bit more coherent to me now, especially in the yep. birth of tragedy, right? Because, like this, it, yep. because now like this in Christianity, that was sort of a unique thing that, the soul is actually the real, like, that's the real McCoy. That is what, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but so what I would say is like the, for example, like the myth, like the Orphic cult that you'll mention. Mm-hmm. Again, Socrates, and Aristophanes made fun of them. They were popular in Rome and they did offer initiates access to a private spiritual bliss, which would continue beyond death. But that being said, all the kind of Greco-Roman matrix, and there is some differences, right? Like Stoics saw the soul as a breath of life. Others say that the souls of the wise persist beyond eternity. Yeah. Some extend it to everyone, right? Some are um, already atheists, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and you got Epicurus, kind of who bases it on the atomistic cosmology of Democritus, and he taught that at death, the atoms of the body is integrated. Yep. Let me ask you and, this. I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I was just going to say, and I'll even go even further, but like the whole idea of corpses raising is ridiculed by Celsus, Prophrey, Julian. And the Jews, too. In some aspects of the second. Yeah. If you're the Sadducees, Temple, they out- Yeah, the Sadducees, who were the f- devout followers of the Torah, who are the most ancient of all the sects of Jews who go back to the farthest, are the Sadducees. They had believed in the Olam Haba, the world to come. They didn't believe in the actual physical resurrection. This is also talked about in the New Testament. Right. But yeah. they also mm-hmm. believed, didn't they believe in Shaul? Like they didn't actually believe in um, the way that we conceptualize the afterlife as yeah. such. Well, no, nobody's perfect. It's like a different dimension. 
Right. Yeah, no, I mean, that's true about the Sadducees. The Sadducees saw the Pharisees as lower class. Right? Pharisees had the view in the general resurrection of all of God's people. Sadducees didn't. Other Jewish sects at the time actually did. There's mm. kind of mm. plenty of them, actually. Well, we can, but we can move seems... on to the uh, resurrection uh, motif right now. Oh, can I but, do one more thing about yeah, the wine? Well, we but before... question real quick. What do you okay. think about or when, 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 uh, when Revelation talks about Hades and death giving up their dead? What do you when you read that, and does that does that not stick out to you as that's Homeric right there? No, not really. I I, I think it's more of apocalyptic literature rather yeah. than Homeric. Mm -hmm. I do agree. With, if you talk about like if you talk about like the he particular like Sheol in the Hebrew Bible, a lot of Ecclesiastes I think is actually a lot more similar to Homeric mm -hmm. literature. But in that sense, well, I, I agree. I agree with that. I well, think there. The, I think this goes back farther than I've even talked. It's not just Christianity. The Jews and the Greeks are borrowing from each other going back to the time of the Torah. My well, the line where they say about how, um, which is one of my favorite lines, uh, it's so poetic, um, where they say, uh, in those days men shall seek a death, but it shall not find them. They shall wish to die, but it shall elude them. That's sort of like, I well, get where you're coming from. No, well, I'm thinking, about, I'm thinking about the Odyssey. I, I, I can't remember which book it is, but it's called The King of the Underworld, where it literally mentions death and Hades having souls so when when i read revelation and i'm like and you, the context to me is like why would it, it specifically mentions death and hate so you can't say it's ha death and death like some translations try to make it they're talking about two different characters death and hates who are from the homeric odyssey i mean i don't know how how else do you interpret that i'm, I'm curious to know what you think about that well I, mean, I don't really see the connection honestly i mean like you know what you often have, again, we're talking about similar words in Greek here, but the, the New Testament view of hell is basically colluding with your own in, in dehumanization. It's a place of shame and separation from God. So just to give, it, to give you another example, like uh, Gehenna, the fires of Gehenna, that was actually yeah, a city. place outside the city, a city where they were burning bodies, right? So they were trying to use this language to express a different kind of reality, but one that was quite different from the pagan view, because the pagan view of Hades is essentially they're sorrowful all the time. They're in a subhuman state, but it's not the same thing as colluding with your where do you get that? Where do you get that in Sheol? I guess you can pull that from Enoch. Enoch well, you can there. buy your way out of Hades, can't you? Like there was various times where you could sort of trick the gods or sort of finagle uh -huh. with them. Whereas in Christianity, um, yeah. Uh, and apart well, from, what about the indulgences? That's the thing, isn't <laughs> yeah, but the indulgences were a very were a temporary sort of thing, and it wasn't like that as widespread as people. But doesn't claim. the Christian doesn't the Christian hell sort of feel like the Homeric Hades a little bit more than? I mean, where I, I'm trying to find in the Old Testament where it actually uh, mentions this this sorrowful underworld place where it's everyone's all the all. But the, Hades isn't necessarily I'm, I'm just for sinners. It's also like. A, a place of just lower entities in general. Yeah. They have a very, they have a different cosmology than Christianity, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, it's not yeah, based yeah. on the moralism of Christianity. Yeah, before some of them go get quite different. Some of them get quite yeah. lucky, like Hercules, where his soul is somehow in Hades, but also the real mm -hmm. him is up there dying with the immortals. Yeah. By the way, before we get to the dying and rising, there is one uh, thing that uh, was not as thoroughly discussed, which uh, Neil brought up. Uh, you were talking about, Tyler, the disgust that the Romans felt ha when it comes to the resurrection of the dead. What about the disgust that the Jews feel when it comes to using wine, uh, you know, for blood as far as a ceremonial uh, yeah, that people activity? Yeah, Daniel mentioned that the w wine was actually used even from the time of the Babylonians in various Jewish rituals, like in Passover. Um but I mean, no, no. Nowadays, don't don't rabbinical Jews now like don't they still have wine? No, well, they like to drink, but that's a different thing. Oh, I thought wine was still integral to some aspect of ritual. I mean, there is like the the Passover seder where you would have just like a glass of wine, but it's not mm. the same kind of uh, wine as in the blood of a deity. Oh thing. no, obviously not. But I'm saying that there's they not, still have. As yeah, far as I'm concerned, there's not one part of the Torah where wine is good in any way or used in, for any ritual. It is just. Maybe. Not kosher. Yeah. Well, the New Testament writers seem to give a nice little place for wine here and there, recommending not drinking too much. But sure. yeah, but but again, I, when we're talking about the Eucharist, we're talking about what matters is essentially that it's a different kind of. I, I'm not going to use the word symbolism. Real presence in the Eucharist. I mean, some some early dynasty accounts talk about wine as being symbolic, but the, what what I'm getting at is the the point is completely different, right? 
but trying to say, that, okay, well, that is the point though, that the, they were, the, the difference is, is what the Christians are trying to emphasize is why they are better or why they are the real way, the real path. That's the thing we should focus on. Like, instead of being like, you drink this wine and Dionysus comes inside of you and you have a bacchic frenzy, they're saying, drink this wine. You have something better than that. You have eternal life from this. Who can, what can beat that? Well, I mean, you, you could say maybe later a Christian apologist said that, but I don't see any reason to read that into the New Testament itself. But what is the connection between the Old Testament, which, I mean, somebody was saying, Super Chad was saying, wine is throughout the Old Testament. There may be things in Song of Songs and things of that nature where it's about, you know, merrymaking, but as far as the actual principle of wine being a representation of Dionysus, which we can all agree here that wine was associated with Dionysus and there was this presence of the living god of Dionysus within the wine itself, right? Can we all agree on that? They're both the vine. They're both called the vine. But can we, uh, Tyler, can we agree on that? Well, About I, Dionysus. I mean, again, in some accounts, they say it's symbolic. Some accounts, they say you, you bless it with Zeus, the savior. Other accounts say it's identified with the wine. Other accounts say it's linguistic usage. But what I'm trying to get at is those originate in earlier festivals, which were largely considered to be cannibalistic, or eating of flesh or eating raw meat. And it's to produce a kind of trance state for a purpose of a soul to go beyond into mm. total ecstasy. I don't see a, any reason. Wait, wait. So, so wine well, wasn't um, used in the, in, chat... the in the latter festivals? Wine was only used in the festivals with the raw meat? And after that, no more wine. No more well, no, wine, no, fellas. No, the other Slime... way around. But... Sorry, well, what were you saying? George Slime says in the chat, the temple sacrifices are finished, but during temple Judaism, wine was used during the peach meal? Piecemeal, oh, okay. Specifically, four glasses consumed during the meal. And then uh, Super Chad says from Isaiah 66, and they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for they, for their worm does not die, and their fire is not quenched. They shall be abhorrence to all flesh. So that would mean that it's not uh, sort of... Mm. The abhorrence of all flesh is an important phrasing there. It's a distinction in a way. You know? So, so, so what I'm saying is there's, there isn't anything in similarity other than the aspect of wine, which again is a superficial connection because it is, again, one of basically two things. Originally in rituals, religious rituals, there's actually water. And then it was water mixed with wine, and then it became wine. But it's not like we have a panoply of options here. We don't have Sprite, Seven Up. We don't have Champagne. Like it, there's basically two. Right. And so beyond that, you have to then establish if there's any similarity and the kind of purpose of the ritual, whether or not there's a similar goal to it, what kind of religious context is in it. In that case, they're very, very different. Now, I could go with Neil. I could say, OK, well, maybe they're saying that to say it's better, that their view is better. Well, in that case, it's just an apologetic for Christianity anyway. So that helps. Now, I, I did want to say one thing about the, you know, boring uh, Jews and Greeks borrowing from each other from Rome and all the like. Well, I mean, that, that's somewhat overstated. I mean, like the Hellenized Judaic thesis is a very old one in the history of religion school. And that came about largely to try and do J, do DJ, oh, why the fuck can't I talk to it? Do Jada is the picture of early Christianity because they wanted it to conform to German idealism. So they ran with the idea of Hellenized Judaism. Oh, based? That, 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 that oh. is largely out of favor now, simply because like it's more true of the Jews in diaspora, but at least of the Jews in Jerusalem. We have, for example, coins of the emperor, which they don't have the inscriptions on it, indicating that, you know, that they were actually accepting the fact that the Jews didn't want to have any other God other than their own, which is something that they were given a unique circumstance to, mostly to, basically try and stop them from trying to revolt, right? There's an absence of pork bones and a lot of the archaeological evidence that we have. There's more reason to suspect, actually, that they became more socially and religiously conservative, not the other way around. Even people like Philo, for example, who does flirt a lot with Greek philosophy and is influenced oh, yeah. heavily by it, nonetheless still holds on to his Jewish identity. So, I, and again, if we get to the later Christian community, first, second, third century, the Romans call them atheists. Largely because they aren't synchristic. They don't influence other, take influence from other philosophies. Mm -hmm. Even people who do take influence from Greek philosophy, like Justin Martyr, for example, are essentially saying within the language of Platonism that we have the true Platonism rather than 
uh, the pagan version, but they still nonetheless try to fit it into an apologetic context for the truth of the gospel. Oh, Tyler, I, I want to break something down here. So in the uh, passage that you wrote for me here, you said uh, that the connection to the Eucharist that people try to make comes from the very early Dionysian cults that have the element of consuming raw animal flesh, although the savage elements disappeared by the classical period. So when I read this, what I get from this is... On one hand, you were talking about the wine, and now all of a sudden you're talking about the consuming of animal flesh, which I did not bring up. So my question is, okay, animal flesh, that was in the past. What about uh, later on? What about the more established uh, period? Was there still the partaking of the wine? And if so, how much, if we you could say like a percentage, how much of a percentage would you give to this wine being the representation of Dionysus? Well, what, the reason I brought that up was not because of anything Neil's said. It's because there's several different versions of what Neil's saying. One of them, which tries to, again, look at and posit that these animals take, have the essence of Dionysus in them in the ritual, and then you then consume that. So that's one of the arguments that people sometimes make, but that, again, has now been refuted. It was based on very slim evidence and the fact it goes the other way around. Um, now, when it comes to the wine thing, I was saying that that is more what you find in the relevant time period that we're talking about, which I, I guess Neil agrees with me on that. That's more relevant to the time period as a Ryan ritual. And yeah, basically all of them start with this kind of premise of libation offering to Dionysus. Right. And, and again, when I was talking about the order of some say Dionysus has more of a linguistic usage identification with wine, this was from, various people of the period trying to determine where that came from, right? But in the sense of, um, is it identified with Dionysus or not? All the ones I've seen seem to say that it's a, tr a trans ritual, but nonetheless begins with a libation offering to him. Libation offering, but then there is an actual partaking of the wine, whether we attribute this later on to Dionysus, Bacchus, Zeus, whatever, the point still is, I hope that you could agree with me here, Tyler, unless I'm getting something wrong here, <laughs> is that when you consume this wine, you are, in a way, consuming the god with a lowercase g. You could phrase it that way, yeah. But again, it... Okay, but that's the important thing here, because when we're comparing, I don't know, Passover Seder, and yes, see what a lapsed Jew I am, that I completely forgot about the Passover Seder. But okay, so you have four uh, uh, glasses of wine that you drink there. There is no relation at all to God, you know, coming into you or possessing you Is it related to the trickster those... goat Seder? No, no, no. no. It is, no, the Seder that's... is related to, it's Passover. It's basically... Point, what you just said. They, what, in, the in, both, in both instances yeah. for Dionysus. I was like, no, no, shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> Convene both, the council. In both instances for Dionysus and Jesus, you have a, a direction, a direct con or a direct uh, connection between the God and the drinking of the wine. Whereas in this couple of Jewish once a year things, they're just drinking wine because that's just what they're doing. It just has nothing to do with Yahweh you're drinking the blood of Yahweh. Nothing like that at all. It's just, yeah, you're allowed to have a couple things of wine because mm. it's, it's... I it's, mean, they symbolize redemption. That is one of the things that they do, but there's no actual having the God go into you or any or any of that stuff. That is something that the Jews frowned upon, and that is why I'm saying, Tyler, that when it at least comes to the similarities, I'm seeing way more similarity between the Dionysian and the Christian rather than the Old Testament uh, Judaism and uh, Christian when it comes to wine. And one last thing about the Zeus thing, too. I know you pointed out, well, some of them, are, some of them have to do with Zeus. Well, yeah, because that's Zeus is Dionysus' father, that's like a godhead right there. That's like a father son in the hermetic sense, the father and the son, you know, connected. Yeah, but, but Gnostic, why, why in particular Dionysus apart from this connection with wine? Because wouldn't you argue that, for instance, um, in terms of the teachings of Christ, wouldn't, like, I, I guess Apollo would come more closer to the teachings of Christ? I mean, in terms of yeah. just raw attribute and, like... No, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I don't think it's just one plus one equals one or a equals a i think mm. that i think that when when they're constructing the narrative in the gospels they're they're saying that jesus is not only a fulfillment of the messianic promise he's also fulfillment of what everyone wants in all of their religions this is he is the ultimate of all the all the saviors he's the, he is better than mithra because he's like mithra in this way but he's better because of this he's like dionysus in this way but he's better because or he's like 
Apollo in this sense, but he's better. Or Asclepius, the healer. He goes around, heals the sick and the blind. He's he's just like Asclepius, except he's better because of this. And they, they hammer that away throughout the gospel. If you really pick it apart, you can see that all throughout the gospels. I have but, no idea how you could see any. As I already demonstrated, I've already refuted this like five minutes ooh. ago. The whole context of Dionysian ritual, again, is a completely different offering of salvation, which is about the soul receiving ecstasy. You're focusing now, on that just alone. That's not what it's all about. That's just no, you're about. focusing on a universal like wine and then saying, okay, that's totally the same thing. Or they're trying to make it look like it's better. But the point of the distinction, Jesus as a Passover lamb, drinking the wine, is not in any relay related to the religious background of Dionysus. It's a particularly different kind of theology, which is not, as I already demonstrated, perceptible within the Greco-Roman world. Of what not, well, the, the ends may be different. Oh, wait, 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 okay. wait. Hold okay. on. If you're going to okay. talk about what's, what, it's, what is perceptible, what it, it actually is like uh, valid for, it can't, you can't say this is valid from the Torah. This is the Torah thing. Because the Messiah is supposed to fill the Torah. Drinking someone's blood does not have anything to do with the Torah. That is something that, and that's my argument. My argument is not that it's copying Dionysus, but this is something that we see in the Gentile world, not in the Jewish world. That's my argument. Well, Tyler, your argument is that the, go- the, end, the ends are different as far as what exactly is being accomplished. What I, I agree with that. What, yeah, what I would say and what, uh, what Neil would agree with me on, on this is that regardless of the end, the actual transmission process, like I remember I went to Catholic school and, uh, you know, it said like when you take this, this is the body of Jesus, this is the blood of Jesus, you know, uh, take Love this is my an blood. expert at Catholic so, theology. Yes, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Because I went to Catholic school until fifth grade. But anyway, the point oh! is that the method <laughs> The method, the method seems to be very similar regardless of the end. So if we focus on the method, what would, at least to you, if you just look at the method and not look at the end point, what but, would be closer to you? What would it be Dionysian? The link between Christianity and Judaism, isn't this essentially a denialism of that sort of foundational link that we've agreed upon for yes. at least two centuries now? Yes, yes, but, yes. The, but what would be the purpose from it? I mean, isn't it just an established fact? I mean... I know the Judeo-Christian thing is cringe. Obviously, it's not real. But in terms of the historic link between the two, I mean, it, it seems that it's kind of like a whole reversal of Christianity in general from its origins. I mean, that's, hmm. it seems kind of, I don't know, kind of... I don't know. Neil, what do you think? taking crazy pills right now. I don't know. Like, I'm not, I don't understand what you just said right there. What, what do you mean? Well, because in, in essence, you're saying that if Christianity comes from a more Hellenistic tradition rather than Judaic tradition, that it sort of reverses the whole order of Christianity on its head, would it not? No, I, I think that it's mostly coming out of the Jewish uh, theology. But I also, right, think that, right. I also think that, I mean, the fact that it's written in Greek tells you one. That's, I, know, I know Christians roll their eyes when I say that, but it's like, really, if this was just to the Jews to fulfill the Jewish mess, Messiah prophecy, why don't we have any Hebrew? Uh, why don't we have any Hebrew uh, gospels? We don't. They're in Greek. They're for the Greek world. So, th- but that being said, they're they're obviously going to play off different popular um, themes that are happening in the Roman world when it comes to religion, religious aspects of, and spiritual aspects. That's to me. I just think I don't know. And I, my my my, well, my Tyler, question, Tyler addressed question, this. Tyler is where where in the where is this. Is drinking Jesus' blood and, and, and eating his flesh, Where is how is that a fulfillment of anything in the Old Testament? What does that have to do well, for, First, I was going to say, New Testament written in Greek to a primarily Greek-speaking language is not really an amazing fact. That's just what they spoke. Right? I, I don't see... What do you mean? They spoke anything. Hebrew in, in Jerusalem. Yeah, but what I said is the Christianity was primarily a missionary religion to the Gentiles. Right? The, what first, you have... Sorry? Or, or At first or after Paul got a hold of it? No, at first, Christ again is there to fulfill the covenant to Israel. Right. Paul brings it to the Gentiles because Jesus routinely breaks social purity laws, for, right? And so Jesus, Paul picks up the brink of breaking social purity laws and extends isn't that, it. Isn't that what this is about, though? That's the whole thing. It's I what failed to the point saying. you're making. It's, it's, they're affirming that God has came in the flesh and He declares His lordship over all, Son of God, as in a deliberate overthrowing of the. Roman Empire's claim to being the son of God. Paul's proclaiming that he is the God over everybody. Right. So I, I don't see what the point you're trying to get at here. This is kind of just like knocking on an open door, as far as I'm concerned. Well, but now, okay, but that, that's fine. Well, the main I, question, I though, about the nature of the fulfilling of the 
Old Old Testament, the old, the covenant. There, the, that's that's all I'm asking. I'm just asking where does that come right. from? That? That's all I'm asking. Where does what come from exactly? Where, where, okay, if, if it's drinking the Eucharist, where how is that a fulfillment of anything in the Torah? Well, I mean, like usually people connect it to Melchizedek, right? Oh, that's good. I'm oh, glad okay. you brought that up because if you if we talk if we go to Jewish scholars on Melchizedek, the actual order of Melchizedek, not in the New Testament, is the is is the Sadducees. Sadduk, Sadducees is Melchizedek. That is where that line comes from. The order of priests that comes from Melchizedek is where you get the Sadducees from. They have nothing to do with Christianity at all. That's just like some so whoever wrote whoever wrote the book of Hebrews was really reaching for that one. And I'm not. And that's not my opinion. That's that's based on any uh, scholarly Jews that read this text and they say this is this is not the order of Melchizedek. This is someone saying it's the order of Melchizedek, but it's not because we know the order of Melchizedek is the Sadducees. It's the priests, the Levites. It even say they even try to make that connection in the Book of Hebrews, which is wild. And the point is. <laughs> What's about, just because oh, later this, Jewish scholars oh, think you're, that. you're saying that the uh, Eucharist comes from the order of Melchizedek when we know that the order of Melchizedek is the Sadducees they have nothing yeah, to do yeah, with that's a bare fact without interpretation they don't you're even believe a bare fact without interpretation you're just saying oh that's not the, the order is the order of the Sadducees I mean so what it's, a common, knowledge, it's common knowledge that Part of the, the early Christian message was, and why it's so radically different from Jewish expectations, is because it happened in a way that they didn't quite anticipate. Sadducees, Pharisees, they openly were against the Christian movement, primarily for reasons that you're saying, which is, again, knocking on an open door here. Now, at, at, now again, to this final point about the wine, again, all, all I'll say is, you know, they often equate Jesus with the Passover lamb, which is also where you get the symbol of the blood and the wine from. But the only connection I'm seeing here is the use of wine, which is a religious universal in the world where there's essentially two kind of drinks to choose from. That's the only connection. I don't see anything beyond that. Well, what about that thing in Catholic school where they told me that when you take this uh, bread, it is my body. When you take this wine, it is my blood. What about it? Well, that's, that's pretty Dionysian sounding. So if Jesus wants you to like cross dress and have an ecstatic orgy so that oh. your soul can experience bliss and beyond. Some new age Christians no. actually believe no. that. This is, import, this is important <laughs> what you're saying because this is how you understand what I'm, what I'm getting at. That's the polemic. The polemic is that Jesus is the perfect man. He's the son of man. This is not a Bacchic frenzy. That's bull crap. This is the real deal. He will give you eternal life. He's pure. He's sinless. There's no more like that. It's it's trumping the Bacchic stuff, all the crazy. And, and that's you should to me. I think you should be more proud of that, I think, because what you're mm. doing is it's a polemic of the wickedness of the Roman mm. world. It's really what it is. And it's the process of taking God within you. And that process can be either used for these frenzies or it can be used for being an enlightened individual and helping others and so on and so forth. These are different paths that you take, but the actual process, there is nothing that I could find within uh, Judaism that it is at all similar to that particular process of a god or the god coming into you through the process of drinking or eating something. That, I think, is the main point here. Well, it's an astonishingly weak point. I mean, this is a common thing among religious rituals of the time. All that matters is the context in which these rituals are set to take place. Well, in which the, other rituals? Time. Which other rituals? Well, I mean, that's comfort. Uh, having pagan rituals, pagan. right? Yes. That well, that's my point. This is something well, what, that's been well, in Godward. pagan rituals, not in not in the Hebrew uh, rituals, not in the Ju uh, Judaic rituals. That's why the Judaic rituals I see as being apart from a lot of these pagan rituals. While this is closer, so when you say it's in other rituals, I completely agree with you. But and that here, actually serves my point rather than yours. Here's the kicker, though, that we're, we haven't even got into yet is the, the how the New Testament. Not only they get Melchizedek wrong, we dirty. We, I, I could get. I, we, I can show you that. Do you want to dig in more than that? That forget about that for a second. The whole entire idea of a sin offering as the Passover lamb, that what they're doing is they're conflating, um, they're conflating the. So okay, let me let's let's go back for a second. Let's go to the text in the gospel. They have Jesus and they have Barnabas, who is and they and they offer both of those people. Say which one do you want us to kill? Which one do you want us to let free? 
Now, this is an allegory of of uh, of um, what is it called? The the other the sin offering. It's the the scapegoat of what is that? What is that? The called? burnt offering. Hold on. It's it's a uh, it's the holiest day of the Jewish. What is it called again? Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Thank you. I just had a brain fart. So what they're doing is they're conflating Yom Kippur with Passover and putting them together and making the sacrificial lamb both the sin offering and the sacrificial lamb. That's false. That's not even what, the, what they're supposed to do. That They're supposed to be a, a scapegoat and a goat that you slaughter for Yom Kippur, and the Passover lamb is totally separate. But what they're doing in, in the text in the New Testament is they're saying that on Passover— they're, they held a trial, which doesn't happen. They didn't hold trials on Passover. And they said, oh, here's Barnabas and here's Jesus. And we're going to kill one and we're going to – that doesn't mean happen. Barabbas? Barabbas? Got, yeah, Barabbas. They got that. Yeah. Well, that If you're a Jew and you're reading that, you're going to be like, whoa, this is fake. This is not real. That's why there's so many Jews that don't that don't buy into it. The arguments are just not good because it's it's clearly written by someone who doesn't understand the, the – uh, the process that that well they, they they know it a little bit but there's someone in the outskirts in the hellenized world that's not in jerusalem that's not really studying this stuff that's not hebrew speaking they're greek people who probably have a septuagint copy somewhere and they're reading the the, the greek old testament and they're making their new testament from that that's what that is that's what that's, that's to me it's obvious to a lot of other jews it's obvious too but it is what it is that's that's how it that's how it started so you're telling me Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul are all Greek? Yes. That is insane. <laughs> that, that flies <laughs> in the face of everything we know about authorship and who wrote these. And again, like just why, why are they written in Greek? Just because some Jews disagree about what the Passover is when the Christianity is supposed. They didn't to be. disagree on it. They got it wrong. That's not what it is. But according how'd they get it wrong? to how'd they get it wrong? According to later oh, rabbinic Jewish scholars. And according to all historical records that on Passover, they don't hold trials like that. That doesn't happen. Yeah, and Passover, you're not supposed to do anything, really. You're just yeah, supposed you don't to chill out. Trial. You don't do a sit. And that's, that's, they have, they'll do the goat thing on, on Yom Kippur. That's Yom Kippur, though. That's not on Passover either. That's an allegory. It's an allegory. I mean, unless you think people don't have free will, that everyone just, like, that's, that sounds like predetermination that they, the world just got set up in a way that there was a, an allegory of Yom Kippur happening. It happened to be the Messiah who happened to run into Jerusalem on a, on a, um, on a donkey. Just like it was like, it, he, I don't know. A lot of it just seems like it's, are we, do we have free will or is this all predetermined? I don't know. Like it's a good question. Well, wait, how do you derive predestination from quote unquote, getting it wrong because if it's passover. not if it's on passover and they're doing you're telling me that all these jews are sitting there doing this trial and not one of them is saying wait a minute isn't this a lot like yom kippur why are we letting one jew go and one that's the what the hell that's that's weird why are we literally playing out an allegory of yom kippur right now on passover none of them said that so, some it just it sounds like a fake narrative that's what it sounds like well i mean the a lot of these kinds of comparisons you don't really find in the Gospels. You find them in the other epistles and letters where they give a theological meaning to it. In fact, the actual Gospel narratives are largely free of these kinds of explanations. Right? They don't actually build on the kind of charismatic theological truths. You find that in the other areas in the New Testament. The Gospel narratives themselves don't actually have those. I agree with that. Wait, and that's, but, uh, and that's, what, and that's what I've been getting at the whole time is that they're taking the story of Jesus and they're they're turning him into the world Messiah, the archetype of the son of God, the world Messiah, mm. the savior. And that's what they're doing in all of these passages. But can we be clear about the New Testament? Because yes, I confess I have not read the New Testament yet. I am still up to the uh, study Bible version of the Tanakh where they get up to Israel. So I'm going to go from there and eventually I'll make my way to the New Testament. By the way, everybody like this video right now and click the bell. I got to show. But anyway, Tyler, I, I when it comes to understand. you got to you can't I got to finish this when it comes to the New Testament. Is there uh, is there a passage there where they talk about the uh, Passover event being when the trial takes place is that written in the new testament could we look that up is that in the particular passage well i'd have to find an exact thing but you do find charismatic truths related to it like through paul and that make allusions to it i'd have to find the exact text 
Mm, all right. If anybody in the chat, by the way, knows where this passage is, please help us out. But uh, anyway, we can move on right now to either d uh, dying and resurrecting gods or kind of have a, a thing in the middle with the uh, various uh, pacifist-oriented uh, uh, things having to do with turn the other cheek and so on and so forth. So which one would you guys feel more comfortable with uh, going first? Tom? Tyler, you can, you can choose, Tyler. All right, go ahead. I mean, we can go with the pacifist thing if you want. Yeah, All right. it's, it's a fun one. This will be a fun one, I think. All right, so Tyler, uh, uh, descri describe it however you'd want the uh, these particular points. And one of the people who you were talking about earlier was Walter Wink, Wink, <laughs> as, as being one of the people who is more liberal, but somebody who you chose to um, bring out as being someone who would be advocating for Christianity, not being this... You know, uh, you know this. Uh, how do I say this? You know, do whatever you want to me. I don't even care. I don't even care what happens. So not. Uh, so you were making the point that it's not that by bringing up certain things that Walter Wink mentioned. I've talked enough. Everybody like this video and click the bell. Tyler, go ahead. You just want me to like reiterate what I said last yes. time? Yes. Yes. Just so we're all on the same page here. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I was responding to the idea that Christian teachings are more amicable to Rome and that they essentially make it so you wouldn't be in any matter. Uh, subversive or resistant and so the passages that neil and james brought up was on the issue of um the issue of turn the other cheek sermon on the mount um walk take walk the bag carry the bag an extra mile and give someone the, give someone your coat now what i said is that these and i use walter wink's description i actually have disagreements with walter wink on a lot of this stuff at least on the ultimate conclusions he draws from it but regardless the point he was mentioning is that when it comes to turn the other cheek what Jesus is alluding to there within the social context is an honor and shame society. When you wanted to shame somebody and you were, for example, a Roman soldier to a Jew or you were a husband to a wife or an, a, basically a superior to an inferior, you slap them with the side of the hand. That would be the dirty side of the hand. All right. So that was a way of designating that they were inferior. And so if they turned the other cheek, what that would basically mean was you would have to, if they were going to slap them again, they would have to acknowledge you as an equal. Right. You put them in a kind of position, which is a form of subversive hmm. nonviolence, but it is nonetheless a form of resistance. Carry the bag an extra miles when Roman soldiers would make them actually carry their bag as like a, you know, go do this for me, be subservient. But if you carried it an extra mile past what the Roman soldier actually was allowed to do, then that was considered to be shaming the soldier because you're essentially saying that the soldier was too weak to do it on their own. And then the last instance I mentioned was on uh, giving your someone takes a coat, give them another. This is referring to Jewish court systems where the accuser, if they won a case and say you, you gave them your coat, you would then have, if someone said, okay, well, I'm going to give you all the clothes I'd have, then you would be naked. And so the person would essentially be in an unjust position where they're taking advantage of the court system and trying to oppress and persecute you on the basis of your status. So it was a way of, again, shaming them. So that is a, a form of nonviolent resistance to a mm. lot of the Roman impetus of the day. And all this, what Walter Wink, Richard Hayes, and other biblical scholars mm. demonstrate is that there is nothing in there which is lay down and take it and so Rome can steal steamroll over you. It's pretty much the opposite. There is another thing that I wanted to bring up within the context of, of this, so I hope it's okay. In that particular passage where Walter Wink, and I uh, read this uh, chapter two of his book talking about this, uh, besides the turn the other cheek, it starts out saying, do not resist uh, an evildoer. So the whole not resist evil, that's been a very, you know, back and forth controversial thing, as far as I understand, within a Christian interpretation. And uh, this is somewhere where there is the term anti stenai And uh, Neil and I kind of went back and forth about this uh, before, before this uh, whole conversation. And if it's okay with you, I want to include that too just like that particular passage of resisting not evil because i think it is connected to the uh, turn the other cheek motive that's all right yeah it is really it's directly there yeah that's, that's okay the whole argument i think right i mean most of it well yeah well let's go with it then let's yeah well then we looked that word up and so according to walter wink i'm not saying you're saying this tyler but walter wink is saying that the word means something else in greek it's what he, he claims well, me and Lev went to go look for this. We, he said that in some, what do you say, 45 times or something like that in the Old Testament, it's used in the context of war. It's, okay, so it says over here in the Greek Old Testament, antistenai is used primarily for military encounters 44 right. out of 71 times. All right, so we have a, a claim that we can check and verify. What, Lev, what happened when we checked for that? What did we find? 
We found maybe, I don't know how many claims. Like we found, uh, we found one time in Deuteronomy, and it was not in the context of war. It was just literally meant not to reta retaliate. Exactly the same context as it is in Matthew. So I, I, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm missing something here, but I looked at, I, I, I tried to steel man this argument. I tried to find exactly what he was talking about. I found nothing. I, the word literally means not to stand up to. So, and if he, it has the word un in front of it. I don't know. If you're saying there's some esoteric meaning behind it, sure. But Walter, uh, what's his last name again? Walter uh, Wink. Walter Wink made a claim that I verifiably was able to check it that was false. I don't know about the rest of it, but that alone would kind of, I don't understand. Maybe you can clear that up for me. But he may, he says 45 out of X amount of times. I only found the word in the Old Testament in the Septuagint like 20 times total. Mm -hmm. It's not even in 45 times. We could even check well, that right now if you want. Again, I'm not a Hebraic scholar, but generally Walter Wink, Richard Hayes, and he's not the only scholar to make that this is generally the consensus, actually. But they tie it to earlier Jewish uh, proverbs, right? They tie it to a, basically a way of saying that you don't engage in one-upmanship or retaliatory violence. That's generally what they tie it into, right? Now, as as in the exact words, again, that's not really my right. area, but that is what the consensus is. But People have a, different interpretations yeah, well, of whether or not that no, means but, absolutely. But there's, nothing, but there's nothing specifically with Walter Ring. I haven't looked at the others, but specifically with him, I did not find anything at all having to do with any other retaliatory, especially in the theme of war type things. The closest I was able to find, there was another book that I ended up looking up. Uh, it was called, uh, hold on, I had the same trouble when we were here. Oh, uh, let's see. No, that's Myths and Poetics. Yeah, but it was uh, intended. Oh, Barbara E. Reed, Abiding Word. So in Barbara E. Reed's Abiding Word, she quotes Walter Wink as well, and she talks about how, uh, you know, uh, the um, she talks about the armor of God passage from the New Testament as being something that solidifies this term to mean, you know, stand against evil in terms of military warfare. But I think that's also a stretch because the word itself is still the same word. It still means to stand. As far as any of the other connotations around it, we don't really have those anywhere where Walter Wink or this person were able to point at them and say, this is what it is. Well, I mean, I mean I'm, again, I, I'm not, this isn't really my area of scholarship. This is what the consensus is. Consensus, right? uh, like, Cons when you say consensus, all biblical scholars? The majority in that um, works in the field of ethics. I don't think so. But Walter Wink didn't provide any evidence for what you're saying. That's well, why I'm confused. Not only that, Walter Wink made a claim. He said, for, he said the word was used 45 out of X amount of times in the Old Testament, the Greek Old Testament. That word is not even used that many times. It's only used like 20-something times. So he's either making this up or he's got a different Greek Bible that I'm not aware of. I'm looking at the Texas Receptus or the uh, Nestle version. I don't know which version he's looking at. I don't even know where he got these numbers from. To me, that's a bad scholarship. If that that would never be my source. That's all I'm saying. I mean, these, I'm listening to two amateurs saying accomplished biblical scholars. Let's look it up then. Let's look, we can do it right now. We can. My my point is again that is what he's getting at. But regardless, the wider context of that entire sermon is based on trying to make it so that the law and essentially the new kingdom becomes written on your heart and it's a radical new way of being. There's several things in it which are not meant to be taken literally. They're excessive on purpose, right? This is actually my disagreement with Walter Wink, actually, because I think he fully absorbs it. Into well, yeah, you're making sense. Method. This makes sense now. Wait now, so, like, for example, um, like, for example, like, you know, if you look at a woman lustfully, pluck out your eye or something, right? I, I think if we were to take that as a complete and total literacy, then someone like Gio here would probably be like uh, in a lot of trouble for his comment on Twitter. <laughs> so oh. what is, there's a kind of radicality of the Christian life within this message, but nonetheless, right. in the context of the specific things that are mentioned, like turn the other cheek in this, it's an admonishment against a kind of retaliatory violence. Right? No, but it's also so, to give your enemy a second chance to reflect hmm. on their action. Well, I, I can see about the turn the other cheek, and I could explain it as far as I understand, and I think you'll agree with me here, Tyler, where when it comes to the actual slapping of somebody, if you slap somebody uh, with the, you know, the I, focus I is on their, hold on, Gio, 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 I must, I must speak. 
when you're slap, I know hashtag geo harassment. I know. So when it comes to the slapping, specifically the right cheek was mentioned. The only way for you to slap somebody with their uh, to their right cheek is with the, your right hand, because left hand cannot be used as far as I know. So with your right hand, the only way to do that is to give them give them the old give them the old uh, backhand slap. But, Which, and that but that's would what be I mean. an insult. It was a grave offense to do that to pimp slap someone. Yes. So in a way, it was the Christian to avoid that humiliation. Yes, and going, that that's fine, except yeah. for except for one thing, which is if you are a slave owner, why would you care whether you use your left or right hand? In fact, I'd assume using your left hand is even more insulting to whoever it's it is you want to Quaid, insult. Quaid DM would... me asking we should do a debate on the slavery thing, Christianity. But uh, go ahead, Tyler. I was say it's a cleanliness thing. Right. They, they use right. that side of the hand because that was a hand that they associated with being dirty. So they were shaming them. If you prefer in the other way, you'd have to use it as an equal. So it's not just that they're like saying, OK, you can't treat us this way. They're saying if you slap me with this hand, you're slapping me as an equal. That is the thing. Well, right. no, no, no. Hold on. Because this passage, Walter Wink was specifically mentioning that when it comes to the slapping, to the right cheek this is something that was done by the masters to their slaves and husbands to their wives they were using their right hand they were not using their left hand to slap what i'm saying is if you are somebody who is you know treating your lowly dog of a person in this very bad way why would you care which hand you slap them with at that point you can freely slap them with your left hand because you want to insult them all the more am i am i wrong here yeah, because you're not thinking of this in terms of an honor and shame culture. The association is with primarily one of shaming them as someone yeah. who's not out of your out group and yeah. is therefore so, so wouldn't you shame them, shame them even much. more? But wouldn't you shame them even more if you slap them with your dirty hand? That is the one you're hitting them with. But that's not what Walter Wink says. Hold on, let me let me read this again because that is not what what Walter Wink was I talking about. I think you're about. getting like you're you're sort of. Confusing the scholarship for the spirit of the actual quote, I feel that's probably. Well, I think I agree because I don't think like, the scholarship is saying that he, he he it means the opposite. I think the, what they're saying is sort of sort of like what Tyler was just saying. There's a right. cleansiness cleanliness aspect going on here. Mm. I agree, I no, no, but Tyler's point no, but... is that because there's a cleanliness point. I, I may misunderstand you, Tyler, but isn't your whole idea that because of the cleanliness aspect, it is even more insulting, and thus. This is why the left hand was like used Rob to Van saw. Hold on, hold, hold on. Where you said pick a hand to Taz. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but just just so I understand. I want to make sure we're not speaking. I want to make sure we're not speaking <laughs> over each other here, misunderstanding each other. So Tyler, Lev, your you contention. Me again, ask you hold to pick on. A hand, your boy. your contention. <laughs> uh, there's a little bit of Ethan Ralph in there. I feel okay. Your contention, <laughs> Tyler, is that is that according to your contention, I'm the, the best host in this the, sector. The. Uh, the masters slap their slaves with the left hand. That is what you're saying, right? In order to humiliate them. The back, they, yeah, the back of someone's left hand. Okay, so now yeah. let's read what Walter Wing has to say. Jesus clarifies his meaning by three brief examples. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Why the right cheek? How does one strike another on the right cheek anyway? Try it. A blow by the right fist in that right-handed world would land on the left cheek of the opponent. To strike the right cheek with the fist would require using the left hand. But in that society, the left hand was only only used for unclean tasks. Even the gesture with the left hand at Qumran carried the penalty of exclusion and 10 days penance. The Dead Sea Scrolls 1QS7. The only way one can strike the right cheek with the right hand would be with the back of the right hand. So the back of the right hand, that was the insulting part. It had nothing to do with the left hand. The left hand, according to Wink, is out. There is no left hand, except for, you know, like cleaning your butt and stuff. Well, so. No, but but uh, but myself in the chat has a great point. He's saying that you're missing the point. When someone slaps you and your natural reaction is to hit back, however, when you turn the other cheek, do not replay an offense with an offense. You are giving grace and teaching. You are giving that moment of reflection for your enemy to uh, realize what they are doing. And, of course, like there's nothing in the Bible that says that if they persist in slapping you that you can't, you know, slap back. I mean, I just don't get this impetus that we were disgusting when we're saying on one hand, Christianity preaches this supremely cucked, uh, pacifist, uh, Quaker and shaker version. And the other hand, 
Christianity is somehow the most violent, oppressive, and evil religion on the face of mankind. Yeah, by I the people. Yeah, by the authorities. Of Christianity. By the authorities <laughs> who are cucking the poor Christian peasants into going to war for them. That makes perfect sense. How does that make perfect sense? Because you're still creating acts of violence in the name of the church. Yeah, the the kings and the nobility get all the little people to commit all these acts of violence for them while they sit in the lap of luxury. Yeah, but the nobility were also in the Crusades. You know that, Lev. To be a knight, you had to. Ha- yeah, to I'm sure. Nobility. I'm sure they like to. They they had some bloodlust of their own, just there like is, a, Lev, just I like Ross. I think you have a very like Reddit view of Christian <laughs> the Crusades. I hate to say it. <laughs> it's not a Christian thing. It's a human thing. People. So get back to the text. Though. Okay. Yeah. So let's right, get back to the right, text. Right. I just this don't is, understand the. To me, this is the most important thing. Because when it's when he opens up, he talks and he says, "You've heard the, the days of old, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth." What he's actually referencing is the Torah. So this is gonna if you, if if the Jesus in the first century, the, in real life, or let's, let's take a time machine to back to, and wherever he says this, if there's any Jews around hearing this, they're immediately gonna go, "What the fuck is he saying? What do you mean? Now, what is he? What do you mean? And I this is the Torah. You're telling us to refute the Torah, but he's actually saying." I say to you, offer no resistance to one who's evil. When someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn the other cheek as well. So he's he's actually put, putting himself above the Torah. It's a polemic, I think. Well, yeah, he is. I mean, that that's affirmed in what I said. That when you are, the whole point is that the law becomes written on your heart. It is above the Torah, right? I mean, that, <laughs> that's that we agree on that. Yeah, yeah. we do agree. All, on that. all I'm saying is that. When you put the thing like turning the other cheek into context, again, it's talking against retaliatory violence. It's talking against tooth for tooth, eye for an eye, especially in the manner which uh, the striking is. It's a personal insult. So you have two things going on there. One sense is that it's saying, no, the personal insult, right? This is what we're talking about here. The other sense is within that context of honor and shame society, that is also implicitly affirming your own dignity. So those two things go together, but you can't fully put it into merely like a political motif. It's more an inauguration of a new way of life, a new community, which is also, in essence, higher than the law, basically. So in that sense, it has a political import. What's well, funny about the previous thing, uh, Godward, good friend of the show, good friend of mine, Godward Podcast, everyone in attendance for the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 was Jewish. He was talking to Jews, uh, telling them not to fight Rome. Uh, so in, I think Godward was saying that the audience that in certain sections of Matthew was specifically for a Jewish audience. And then when it came to Paul, then of course he was talking to Greeks, he was talking to Gentiles, he was proselytizing. So I don't, uh, as for the previous discussion, I, yeah, I don't, uh, Hmm. you know what I mean? Like, I I just don't understand how there can not be this uh, truth that there is both in terms of that switch of audience mm-hmm. i don't I mean i mean I, I could i could definitely take the idea that tyler like we have a fedora about right here the... in the chat that's saying about how christianity is so evil i mean that's oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Gio, Gio. we oh. i think i agree with tyler when it comes to the slapping part that that i could see room for that being interpreted in that way with the reverse slap and all that but the part that still strikes me is the uh, part about resisting evil where again that's that i think has been the much more contentious part of this whole not just the dialogue we're having right now but others and tyler i think that when you were talking about us two being amateurs in comparison to walter wink that is kind of like the uh, tactic of appealing to authority which i think all of us are above here so i would say let's actually look Look at what the authorities are bringing up. What connections can they lead us down to actually prove what they have to say? Th- then and only then will I be able to take what Walter Wink is saying as something that is uh, factual. But what can you give me that Walter Wink said that affirms this military-style use of uh, resist, resist in this very tactical war way? Because I'm not seeing it. Again, when I when I mentioned like you know, you guys are authorities. What my point in saying that is that like the minuta of everything that Walter Wink says about where he gets these words. Again, we're talking about someone who is a Greek scholar. So but he doesn't say it. Is, but he doesn't say it. If you show me where he says it, I'll agree. But he doesn't say it in this book, at least. Well, also it's not even just him. People like Richard Hayes and other scholars have said that, right? My point is, my point is, is that the, what the passage is about, and me and Neil already agreed on what it is about, doesn't in any way lend to a kind of let yourself be a doormat, is what we're getting at here. Now, do not resist evil has been linked to 
Jewish wisdom proverbs about retaliatory violence. That's where the link comes from. And that's what the context of the passage is. Can you provide me a, uh, I know I'm being kind of vouchy here, but can you provide me with one proverb j- just so I can look that up later on? Like which, which specific proverbs are we talking here? Well, like Zom 37.1, Proverbs 24.19. Right. The whole idea there is that within that social context that you don't compete with evildoers by trying to outdo them in terms of getting back at them. Right. Yeah, they're they're definitely there's definitely from I can't like point to any, but I can probably agree that there definitely are some proverbs that are uh, Mm -hmm. relatable to what's being said in Matthew. I, I, I I would I would agree with that. Well, you said Proverbs 23, 19, right? Or 24, 19. I said 24.19. Oh, 24.19. Be okay. not provoked by evildoers nor envious of the wicked. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. No, he's yeah. got a point. Proverbs, uh, there are some proverbs that would, I would say, would line up with the teachings of Jesus. I, I wouldn't deny that, deny that one bit. Oh, uh, mm-hmm. there's, there's also the fact that scholars scholarship consensus agrees on that a lot of proverbs come from Egypt and not from uh, Israel that are older than Israel. They come out of Egypt. We have Egyptian text of these proverbs. Hmm. But when we're talking about being envious of the wicked, does this imply that to be wicked means to wage war? If that doesn't imply that, then what's the connection between standing uh, is standing firm, meaning to stand firm in a way that you're, you know, that you're engaging in a kind of war against somebody? That that's what I don't see the connection for here. I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm <laughs> confused, but that's why I'm not seeing the connection. The context. Sorry, the connection is just the proverb itself. That's what the connection is. Okay, I don't know. I, I don't see it, but I think we can... Uh, well, let me... Yeah, let, okay. Can I go back to when we were talking about... There is a great passage from uh, John... This is John 6, where Christ is both mentioning... He's arguing with the Jews about the body and blood, but also he is mentioning those older traditions, saying that your ancestors did drink manna, but they died still, and I am the only way of life. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. And then, of course, you have this, he said, the Jews are grumbling among themselves, and Jesus chastises them, and he says, um, stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sends me draws me, and I will raise them up until the last day. Um, and then, of course, that's a time where you have a lot of Jews that leave Christ saying this is a very hard teaching to accept when Jesus says in Matthew six fifty eight, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whom feeds this bread will live forever. He said, well, the teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. Yes. So you do have this back and forth going on. And so I think there is this this pulling. There's this sort of uh, hermeneutic aspect of pulling pushing and pulling and there is this resistance to the teaching that inevitably breaks through so i don't think that it's a very like this seamless like psychological operation transition from the judaic teachings to christ but but also there's nothing in the manna itself it's not like they're eating the manna and god is coming into them through the manna the manna is what christ was saying though that you your ancestors drank the manna and still died i mean he meant the spiritual death. yeah well but, but then it's interesting to me. It almost sounds like Christ is continuing this spiritual transference of God energy uh, into the human through this libation, uh, as opposed to what the Jews were doing, where they were not partaking in the paganistic rites that would have enabled them to contain within them a God. And in this case, contained within them would be Jesus. And in a way, it does continue that tradition, albeit for a different purpose, which is, you know, world peace and so on and so forth. Yeah, but, and... You, but you understand he's eating on both that Talmudic tradition and the ancient Hellenic traditions. He's saying that both of them are overwritten by. The new Wait, tradition. Talmudic tradition? The Talmud was written. Sorry, not Talmudic. The, <laughs> the you know, Judaic, Judaic tradition. Talmud came later. Yeah, yeah. No, um, I, you know I, just, I mean. like, no, he's I understand. Getting rid of both of them. I understand he's getting rid of them, but that does not change what I said earlier about if I were to pick a side that leans closer to Christianity in the sense of the actual process of transference, it would be the process of the paganistic rites as opposed to the uh, Jewish process. So I agree with you that, yes, you could say that this is the replacement, but this replacement is a lot closer to the paganistic rites as opposed to... But in the same 
same, but then in the same one in 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 um in John six at the very end at seventy, he says, "Here I come, chose to you the twelve. You're the one who is the devil. One of the twelve is the devil, uh, Simon Iscariot." So notice how in the same instance, he's saying that this group of Jews has left him as his, his, his followers, but also you have the announcing of one of you is the devil. So there is that sort of, if you will, that acknowledgement that there is that not just betrayal, but that the message will be hard to take on. It will be the path of the narrow, it will be the narrow path. So there's a lot of significance yeah. within the end of John six there um, as to in completing the, like I'd have to read on, but for, I get what you're saying, Lev. It's just that I, I just don't see, I mean, he's not, if anything, if it really was him furthering that Hellenic tradition, then he would, I think Christ would outright say it, would he not? Like he would, he 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 doesn't have very much of a reverence mm. for that. Well, I have a question uh, for, for Neil regar re regarding that, and we are going to get to the dying and rising right, gods right, afterwards. Right. But uh, quickly, Neil, what was it that you were mentioning about, or somebody in the chat may have been mentioning about how Paul and uh, all the uh, Jewish people at that time that they were pretty much Hellenized, and how much of a role uh, that that played? Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, the question is how much, how much of the world was Hellenized, or what about? Paul? No, 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 no. Specifically, if we're talking about like the Paul, the apostles, and everybody, how much were they? And I know that Paul, you know, being Saul was the rebel. You know, he was the one who was anti all of this Roman uh, stuff. Yeah. But still, as far as the culture that they were all in, this was in the shadow of the uh, empire of uh, Alexander the Great. And how much of an effect did that have in the culture that the Jews, despite the Torah and all that, uh, had within themselves? Well, I mean, the, if you go back to the generation following Alexander the Great, when the wars broke out between the four sections of his kingdom, uh, the Ptolemaic Empire of Egypt started to translate the Hebrew Torah and the books of the prophets into Greek, which is the Septuagint. And that started spreading like wildfire all over the Eastern Roman Empire. People in Syria really loved it. People in, I mean, Paul, it says his name is Saul of Tarsus. If he's really from Tarsus, that's the giant port city right in southern Turkey, almost north of Syria, in that, right in that corner of the Mediterranean. So he would, have been, he would have been in contact with tons of different uh, philosophical worldviews, different religious texts, the Septuagint. Uh, even and if he really was a student of Gamaliel, which a lot of Jews contest, because there's really no mention of that in any of the Talmudic references, it could be true though. If he really was, then then yeah, he would have been, he would have had a split personality because he's living, for, he's from Tarsus, but yet he's being taught at the foot of Gamaliel from the school of Hillel, who is one of the uh, uh, founders of the Talmudic sort of Platonic Jewish Judaism that came after the fall of the temple. And um, yeah, and he was, he's actually quoted from, he's actually quoted saying that the whole of the Torah is to love your neighbor and treat him how you want to be treated, which is mm. fascinating. So it all comes together. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think there's probably some truth to it. I think, yeah, that Paul mm. really was who, he, who they say he was. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to the final part of the discussion today. And I appreciate everybody he being here once again. Please be sure to like and click the bell. Every single like you people give is a kiss on the cheek, if not on the lips, for this stream. Because what it enables us to do is it gets the algorithm to recognize the fact that Break the Rules is growing, brings more people on board. So the more likes you give, it's very important. And also, I want to do a quick shout out to the queen of the chat, MJ May 4999, currently the reigning queen, the reigning monarch. If you want to become king or queen of the chat, then you have to usurp MJ May by bringing in 50 or more. So, and we'll see, We're, we may do something very special with the winner, if we can get in contact with them, maybe a free, uh, I don't know, astrological reading. I don't want to speak for Michael Scotto here, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Anyway, Dying and Rising Gods, uh, Tyler, uh, take it away as far as the uh, intro from uh, what you were talking about last time with the Dying and Rising. Yeah, sure, I'll get it. I did quickly want to say <laughs> something about what... Uh... Neil said just right now, though, I mean, there is truth to that. Paul, for example, in the letters, he deliberately quotes Stoics and then refutes them in the next sentence, right? He is educated. He is from Tarsus. So he did, did raise some time in Jerusalem, too. But, yeah, he, he does openly uh, 
conflict with a lot of the pagan philosophy of the time, and he does certainly know it, right? right. But nonetheless, the view he puts forth is more in line with Judaism, right? And specifically, some of the Second Temple views. But um, very Paul is a very educated man. Like that's just yeah. Mm. yeah. Oh, but, um, and, also, and also, and also, well, one well, one quick thing. One quick thing I just wanted to say for the people who uh, say about some Zohar speak, hey, Lev, they're probably referring to the Kiss reference. Geo, I was actually thinking about the Kiss of Peace as the traditional Christian greeting when I said the kiss, just, just so you know. So there we go. Yeah. And I was, I was just going to say, as for you talking about uh, Hellenized Judaism, Lev, it, again, I, I, I said this earlier, it depends where we're talking about. The Jews in diaspora were a far more Hellenized than the ones in Jerusalem, even though, again, they're still under control. They nonetheless, archeological evidence, evidence from Josephus and all the others is that they were more socially conservative in their identity and more Jewish than they were less willing to be synchristic. And then you find that later on, Roman authorities start calling uh, Christians atheists, right? But as with dying and rising gods, this is kind of like a Frisarian contract, right? Uh, guy wrote the Golden Bough. But basically, like the story with the dying and rising gods is that from early times, Egypt and elsewhere, is that a lot of major religions centered their symbols, stories on practice on the cycles of nature and gods and goddesses who enact that cycle in themselves. So you basically have like a whole variety of dying and rising gods in this context, at least if we accept the older view of dying and rising gods. And so what they are arguing is that um, basically in these cults is a ritual reenactment of the death and birth of gods that are coupled with fertility rights. So when you get in touch with the forces of the, the natural back. world, then you would have hope to guarantee crops and offspring. And so the myth is supposed to be operative here is death and resurrection, right? Of new life on the other side of death. That's at least people are trying to connect it to Christianity, we'll say. But even if we accept the outdated view of dying and rising gods, which it is very outdated, there's basically no hope for physical resurrection of believers here, even in the traditional models. The cults reenacted death and resurrection as a metaphor for the cycle of seed time and harvest, reproduction, and fertility. Right on, on the Jewish side of things with the Greco Roman world, we did talk about that within the milieu of Second Temple Judaism. We don't have any sign of dying and rising gods, although we do have, despite Ezekiel's condemnation, but of even if Jewish we women accept were participating in the Tammuz cult earlier, oh, we're glad to know that, but um, well, of course, but in this sense, when the Christians spoke of resurrection, they're not talking about a yearly event of sowing seeds and harvesting crops, they could use images of sowing, they could celebrate Jesus' death with the breaking of bread, but. The story is really not on the same match, right? So when Paul preached in Athens, he never said, no one says, oh, this is a new version of Osiris or whatever. They basically said he was a crazy man. But um, the, the bigger problem with this, though, is that that kind of contract of a general oriental vegetarian god, vegetation god, sorry, I hope not vegetarian, who periodically <laughs> dies and rises from the dead is something that has long been discredited, right? So just to, and part of the reason is because there, and even Ludwig Wittgenstein was one of the early critics of Fraser, is that they try to take these elements out of these other mythical stories, and then they try to take them out of the context, to try to make it fit a general dying rising pattern. And in some ways, they retroactively put Christian, Christian ideas back onto them. But just to name like some examples, Osiris, he's murdered and his body is dismembered and scattered. And then pieces of his body are collected and rejoined. And then he's rejuvenated, but he doesn't return to the kind of existence he has before. But he goes to the underworld where he becomes the god of the dead. And so in that sense, no, it doesn't match a kind of Christian resurrection. Uh, Adonis, on the other hand, he has two different mythic traditions. And one, there's no death and no resurrection, but there's bilocation where he spends one part of the year in the upper world and then another part in the lower. And only myths about Adonis long after Christianity is he essentially tied to themes and stories that are influenced by Christianity. But in regards to Addis, both traditions include his death, but there's no rebirth and he's not even a deity. And the same thing we could go through with Thomas, Marduk, Baal, Isis, Dionysus, right? They don't have any kind of concept of any kind of resurrection, right? So what we do have, and this is different from when dying and rising gods came about, was now we have an abundance of data while when the scholarly construct of dying and rising gods is created they actually have a lot less data but what we'd have now is this kind of skeptical literature just gets carried over from one popular writer to another and you look back at the sources doesn't matter if you're talking about freck and gandhi or tom harper or earl de Herdy or, or even robert price they all reference earlier sources that have long been long been new past right so when we actually look at these stories, I'm glad you didn't say debunked because they haven't been debunked. 
Right. Well, they have. James but been debunked. He's about to finish, though, yeah, right? God. What I was saying is what we have in the history of religion is that immortality isn't a prime characteristic of divinity. These gods die, and then in some cases the gods disappear. So essentially what we have is that some disappear, some disappear only to return again in the distant future. Some disappear and reappear, but all the deities that have been identified as belonging to the class of dying and rising deities can be some. Uh, can be thought of as two larger classes, basically. So disappearing deities or dying deities. In the first case, the deities return but have not died. In the second case, the gods die but do not return. There's simply no unambiguous instance in the history of religions of a dying and rising deity. Well, let me just add also as well that you have to realize that Fraser was the first sort of proper, like ethnography of religion proper. And there is quite a few... Um, at the time, the text that he was available to him, especially when it came to African deities and so forth, uh, there was a lot of mistranslations. For example, when it came to the 19th to 20 to early 20th century, very early 20th century scholarship of, uh, for example, Max Mueller's Sacred Books of the East, a lot of it was misinterpreted. And then later, you had, just as an example, when people like Daisat Suzuki came over, they had to almost Christianize the message of, for example, Zen Buddhism for their audience. And I think Fraser had to do a lot of the similar work there. So then, of course, you have this sort of bricklage of false scholarship that's built up on each other. Not false scholarship, but rather misinterpreted scholarship. So I think with any one of these sort of ethnographic views of religious ritual, I think there's always going to be a lot of things lost in translation, just as an aside, right? So, so, so just to, uh, you said a lot there and it's because the, the, the key mistake that a lot of apologists do, and you just did, you just did too, is that you think that it's supposed to all line up perfectly with Christianity as if Christianity copied them. And, and that's not the argument. The argument is not that Christianity copied them. because this is this, this is kind of going to be similar to the argument before with Dionysus because it fits the archetype. Okay, and here's what I mean by that. So, you have a, a, a you have a, a a man or a god. A lot of times it's a it's a it's a mortal like Romulus who dies. Romulus dies. He uh, he is sent to the right hand of this is this is this is Levy right here. This is my source for Livy. Uh, Livy says that Romulus dies. First of all, he's born from one of the Vestal Virgins. He dies, ascends to the right hand of Zeus, and then comes back and saves R Rome. You're right about that. He doesn't bring, he doesn't raise the dead. That is true. Now, a lot of these, a lot of the, th a lot of the mistake that mythicists make or parallelomanious people like that you're, that you're talking about, which you have every right to, to uh, label them as, because this is what they do, is they'll say they all have the same attributes. They all are born on December 25th. They all are born. They all died and they're all resurrected and they all, they all, they, they just, I don't know what it is. They all, it's like zeitgeist and that's false. They all have very specific, their own personal things. But when you put them all together, like in a Venn diagram, you would get Jesus in the middle. Like, so for example, like Addis, Addis dies and Addis is actually a uh, equivalent of Mithra, basically. I mean, he's even depicted having the Phrygian cap and slaying the bull. And he is resurrected, like you said, as a vegetation god. Now, this is this is where I agree with you on. Most of these are agricultural deities who, when they die, it's a metaphoric for wintertime and resurrect as it, uh, is um, metaphor for springtime, which is Easter, spring, equinox, paschal moon. But um, but when you look at them all, so the, the thing is, is we instead of looking at the little details you have to take a step back and realize that this is an archetype this is a this is a class of gods who for example um i'll go to anana anana is the oldest one out of all of them she when she died and this is a save, salvation god too a lot of them are salvation gods the Louisiana mysteries you you would take you would get initiated and you believe that persephone would raise you from the dead for in the case of osiris you had funerary cult there's a funerary cult where you would write a certain hymns to Osiris when you were buried. Those would go in your sarcophagus. You would get put in the underworld, and they would give you um, it would give you instructions on how to save your how to resurrect into heaven. So with Inanna, it's even more it's even more specific to to what we're talking about because Inanna slash Ishtar or Astarte. This is all equivalents in different languages. She 
that goes down into hell for three days. It specific, specifically says three days. Jesus is she then comes the man days. too, if I recall. She save yeah, she saves. No, I don't think she comes back. She saves Tammuz, who is an anointed healer god, is equivalent to Asclepius, who's also the healer in, in Egypt or in uh, in Greece and Egypt. But anyways, those two get sort of conflated as being representation of the of the the uh, morning star Venus. So this is the astrotheology layer of this: is that Venus is the dying and rising um, planet, if you will. And um, Inanna, when when Inanna or Ishtar, when she rises from the dead, she brings the dead with her. She does resurrect the dead, and um, there. And, and then for Mithra, Mithra doesn't die, but Mithra is a as a savior god. Mithra does resurrect uh, the dead when he slays the bull. So, like I said, yes, they're all. Di- very, very glaring differences between each one. But when you take a step back and you look at all of them like a Venn diagram, you see that there's a there's common motifs. There is the death and resurrection and the hope of salvation within most of these, within the majority of these. In fact, Richard Carrier, um, Richard Carrier made a list of 15 gods and not even gods, characters from the ancient world who fit a list of 16 characteristics, 16 characteristics. The hero's mother is a virgin. Father is a king or heir of a king. Uh, con- yeah, unusual conceptions. Son of a god. Attempt to be killed when he's a baby. Uh, escape when he's speared away and those trying to kill him. Reared in a foreign country by one or more foster parents. Told nothing about their childhood. Returns to a future kingdom. Becomes a king. Has laws prescribed. Mysterious death. Uh, loses those are favorite. pretty broad categories, I gotta Eric, say. Those Eric are Richard Carey is also kind of a joke, but anyway, anyway let's go on. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Carey's not a joke at all. I, yeah, I love, to hear, I love to hear. I, I would love to hear someone. Re- I mean, I don't agree with him that Jesus didn't exist, but I do agree on a lot of his. Like for example, what I'm saying right here, you have 15 people who have 12 or more of those 16 things, 15 gods, 12 or more of those. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, those are pretty broad, and plus you're assuming. Oh, sorry to cut you off, Todd, but specific. But you're assuming that they would a virgin. Yeah, but but you're assuming that that knowledge of those previous traditions would carry on all the way to the time of Christ. If I mean, there were there were sort of whole bodies of knowledge that were buried in the ancient world through various you know burnings of libraries and so forth. I mean, that's a, unless you're going to make an argument from a purely let's call it Jungian I, metaphysical, like archetypal. Yeah, that's thing. exactly what my argument is. It's the same thing I said with Dionysus. It's not, they're not copying Dionysus. Jesus is not copying Inanna or, right. but they're, what they're doing is they're, they're, they're fulfilling the archetype and making no. it better. It's, it's I'm a, a okay, okay, hey, hey, let, like, I'm let me ask you answers. Oh, Mithra doesn't offer any kind of salvation. The only evidence of that, of any kind of salvation ideology is a piece of graffiti that was found in the, Santa no, Prusa Mithraeum, which is dated, well, hold on, which is dated no earlier, by the way, than 200 AD. And it actually says, in us too, you saved by spilling the eternal blood. But this refers to spilling the blood of the bull, which- There you go. Way, That's what I just said. That's right. what I said, no, no. though. Hold on. Hold All on. Right. Which <laughs> modern Mithraic scholars like David Lanzi and the like, what they're actually referring to here is a kind of astrological interpretation. It doesn't mean salvation in a Christian sense, but an ascent right. through levels of initiation. Shit. Now, as for the bull, again, I mean, he didn't, Mithra didn't sacrifice himself. He wasn't the great bull of the sun, but rather he killed the bull, right? Kind of attempts to identify him with a bull or pretty much outdated at this point. And it was not for any kind of world peace or world salvation. Some people do try and interpret it as like a creation myth, right? Even though Kumat says that, I think that's entirely wrong. But regardless... The only kind of sacrificing himself is that he went out and took a risk to do a certain kind of heroic deed. There isn't really any kind of parallel with Mithra and Christ. In that's that what you regard. keep doing is you keep focusing on the little tiny details. But the, the what I'm saying is when you it's the it's the grand scheme of all of this is the archetype of it of the and and I did say that when I mentioned Mithra. Mithra is just one of Mithra is probably the mm. least. But, but, but not to wait, but, but let's say something case them first. Mithra is the weakest out of all of them. The only thing about Mithra that I think Mithra is specifically called Logos and the mediator between Ahura Mazda and man. So Mithra, if you're initiated in the Mithra rites, Mithra can speak on your behalf and give you eternal life in heaven. 
That's what they believe. Well, wait, there's two types of Mithras too, well, as Tyler was said. said yeah, yeah, well, Mithras well, is the morning star. I'll get there in a second, but I mean, like you, you do have the role of mediator with Mithra, but that's in the sense of a mediator between Zoroaster's good and evil gods. Yeah, Ahura Mazda. Yeah, that's and right. now there is a reference to a logos that was taught by Mithraic initiates. Yep. Right, but that simply again means word and. The, it goes back earlier, even in Judaism, like with Philo, for example. So it seems yeah. to me more reasonable to suggest that they got it from there. But my, my point is, is someone simply says, okay, well, you're looking at the... This is kind of what Robert Price does, by the way. When he gets taken a task for... Brilliant, by the way. Dying, Price rising Price. God. Sorry? That's a, he's a brilliant double PhD biblical scholar. But yeah. yeah, he's so brilliant, he can't get published by any peer review. He had to start his own where he publishes... He's got his own, he, gets pub, he gets peer reviewed all the time. He's got a yeah. hundred books written. Yeah, none of them are. He actually started his own. Yeah, he has his own. He couldn't get published. That's not. But anyways, my point is, my point is, uh, Robert. Yeah, he publishes people like Robert. Friends of ours, for example, who points the idea that Jesus took drugs to survive the crucifixion. I'm not saying Christ is that. That's (laughs) fucking (laughs) crazy. Who said? He actually said. Regardless, he didn't say that. I I never said Robert Price said that. I I know. He just asked. But now, I, now oh, I'm saying... Oh, people in uh, his publisher, you... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that's fucking get bonkers. Holy okay, my shit. point in bringing up Robert Price isn't to attack him. My point is he tries to get around this by simply saying, oh, well, how close do these details need to be? Well, for example, if we're talking about a virgin birth, we need an instance of divine fiat in order to make it an actual parallel. What you have with Mithra, for example, is he comes out of a rock, a fully born man. Right. This isn't a virgin birth unless people the know what they do with rocks in their but free time. Focusing, right? This is what I keep saying. You keep focusing on these these specific things, but you're not what you're what you're failing to see. It's like you got this giant building ahead of you and you're looking at the bottom of it. But like just look up and you'll see this is a. I mean, like, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll give you another example. Mithra is the weakest one. I only the only reason why I brought up Mithra is because Mithra is the archetype of the morning star who is the mediator between God and man. Who can say who has initiation that can save you? That's the only reason I brought that in. There's specific, broad details that we have to look at that they all check boxes on. You got the in the in the Roman Imperial cult right in the first century. You had the cult of Julius Caesar, who was killed by the Senate. When he died, he ascended into heaven on the right on the. Uh, I, I think it was on the. I think I don't know if it said right hand of God, but it's on the throne of God. Julius Caesar. This is an Ovid's Metamorphosis, where he ascends into heaven, and his he's he becomes um, he becomes live. He his son Augustus is this divine son of God who who um, fulfills all of his. He kills all of the of the conspirators while Julius Caesar basically gets avenged from the grave. So this is and why do, why am I telling this story? Because this is a theme, this is a genre of the time period of gods who die and avenge themselves from heaven. So, so it's like now we have today we have music and movies where you might be watching, uh, uh, I don't know, you're watching Jason thriller movie, and they in that movie you might see something that's borrowed from another movie. Doesn't mean they're copying it. It just means that this is what's in the air at the time. It's the genre. And it's it's uh, it's influencing. They're all influencing each other. So by the time Christianity, well, the metamorphosis comes about, of view of uh, it's largely viewed nowadays as a work of literary fiction, or is it viewed as an actual what? sort of pantheon of, of Greek mythos? The 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 uh, the metamorphosis by Ovid. It's just it's um, Greek Roman mythology. Right. right. Well, anyways, on the Roman divinization of emperors, I mean that does go back a long way in the line of. Uh, the Greek Roman pantheon and Greek writing on various kinds of speculation, right? It's not really a new idea, but they had distinctions even early on between gods and heroes and gods and ancestors. And the heroes had feasts at their tombs because they thought were to be nearer to the gods, right? That's a practice that carried on. And then, as I mentioned earlier, others like Hercules made it to the company of the gods. But when it comes to the divination of rulers, like Alexander the Great, I think Lev might have mentioned him earlier, but he represented himself as you know a son of Zeus, expecting divinization after his death, and that was encouraged by his quasi worship in Persia and Egypt. And he actually ordered worship in Greece and Macedonia, and there was a lot of dissent about that. Yeah, he, that, was, he was called the son of God, and he was seen by a vision by Seleucus after his death. Yeah, and the deified son of God who comes back to comes back to the world and gives people their fortunes. Like, it's, yeah, this, and, this, is a, this is an archetype. This is a this is a theme, a genre. 
that plays in religions. For, for no, again, though, this is where you're not getting the point, though. Right. When it comes to Julius Caesar, for example, which, you know, Seneca makes fun of this, uh, makes fun of this whole process of how divinization is discovered and how we know, like the emperors are supposed to be divine. It's by someone has to be a witness to their soul ascending to heaven. This is basically what is astral immortality. And there's obvious connections here between here and the platonic and later developed idea from platonic philosophers about the star and the soul being made of essentially the same thing. And so you some of the great ones, the immortals get to go to live among the stars, right? But they had what was consistent with the burning of the physical body, right? Nobody here thought graves were empty, right? This is a kind of ascent to heaven that's astral, right? Some of them go back to, and the idea that after death, humans become stars, it goes back to Pythagorean philosophy, Orphic religion, uh, Babylonian sources, Egypt sources. And again, with Cicero, he slants this view of Plato towards uh, good citizenship. But the point I make here is this flight of the soul is not consistent with the kind of Christian belief in physical bodily resurrection. This ties into what I said at the very beginning of this whole stream, which is that the view on offer here is either a platonic soul leaving a prison house of a body because he thought the, the physical world was degraded and trying to stay here would be abhorrent, or there was a subhuman state. But the, the divinization of emperors comes out of platonic thinking and an idea of astral immortality, which is a rejection of the physical world, which again has zero resonances with the Christian notion of resurrection. You're talking about a specific area of your theology and saying they if they don't all if they don't all believe in this one specific thing of my theology, that means all of those things that you mentioned that are facts don't matter. They're just, it's I'm, kind of an important part I'm, of Christian no, theology. I, no, I, I get that. And I'm not saying they're all the same. I'm not saying they're all exactly the same, but I'm, what I'm saying is there definitely was a genre a literary motif of the dying and rising savior, son of God character. That's there's, there's all over the world. It's just a fact. Well, can I, can no. I say something really quickly? Oh, Tyler, go ahead. Then I'll say something. No, I was just saying, the only way you can make that claim is if you get rid of the context and details of these particular stories to try to drive some kind of universal archetype out of them. But when you look right. at them in context, you get a picture very different. So when I'm saying that of the Dior offer here is a platonic soul, or which in the case of Dionysus and cults an ecstatic life beyond death, is that the soul here in this model is completely opposed to the Christian one. They found the idea of body resurrection abhorrent, right? And so when you, combine, what, when you combine with what I'm saying, with what I said earlier about various surveys of these deities. Not the Egyptian cults, not the funerary cults of Osiris. They, this was a res these were resurrection, physical resurrection cults. Well, they believed in some kind of process after mummification. Yeah, but right. they didn't. Have I mean, it was still okay. large. That's Christian, where the Christian. Yeah. That's where the Christian idea of the the. Yeah. That's where it, why would the Romans accept that's these Egyptian claim, cults? Though. No, no, the but Jews hold on, hold on. Why would the Christians? Uh, sorry, why would the Romans rather accept these Egyptian cults if they were so by the resurrection? If that's what was going on in the Egyptian cults, I mean, there was this mishmashing of the Egyptian cults within the uh, Roman, uh, you know, uh, R Roman times at that point, was there not? Uh... Well, like, look, as I keep having to say, all these kinds of variant gods and mythologies and religions, mystery cult, they all have one thing in common, which is they trace the ideal lineage and passage of the soul back to Homer. And that's the milieu in which these things. There's different paths. Wait, the philosophers wait, didn't like a lot. Of wait, what do the Egyptians Inanna, have to do with Homer? Inanna have Inanna goes back to Homer? I'm not talking about Egyptians, right? I'm talking about the Greco-Roman pantheon. You said all of these gods that I mentioned, and a lot of them are not. I didn't say that you mentioned. I was responding to Lev. Okay. No, but I was talking about the Egyptian. But I was talking about the Egyptian gods as well. Uh, that's would, what you were like, responding I would caution, to me. I would be so, skeptical. So, no, no, but hold on, Gio. You were responding Wait. to me when I was talking about the Egyptian go gods by mentioning Homer. What does that have to do? What does one thing have to do with the other? Well, I must have misheard you because I thought you were asking about mingling between these. Well, I was specifically talking about mingling between the Egyptians and the uh, ancient Romans at that time, where the point that you were bringing up is, hey, like the Romans are so disgusted, you know, they don't care for this bodily resurrection. Meanwhile, Neil was talking about the bodily resurrection being part and parcel of the Egyptian cult processes. So why... 
it doesn't make any sense. Why would you have why would you have all of these Egyptian cults within Rome if the Romans utterly detest this whole process? It doesn't make sense. Well, one, you don't. In fact, the cult of Osiris in the first century AD was not really that prominent by that time. Its influence had whoa, waned. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Yes, it was. Ser- he, he that by the first century he became Serapis. They combined him with the Apis bull. He had his own temple in Rome. He was huge in the first century. That's not true at all. Well, we have Osiris was in his prime in the first century. Well, at least from what I've read, that the influence of the Egyptian culture. Serapis, do you know what Serapis looks like? He's a bearded man, looks like Jesus. Oh wow! Are you gonna try to catch a, a purse robber with that description? He's a bearded well, man. Well, <laughs> well, it's, it's important to point that out because the earliest ah, pictures, the earliest pictures of Jesus are a man with a shaved face with a wand in his hand, turning water into wine with a wand. That's the earliest. That's the if you go back to the farthest pictures of Jesus we get. That's what we get. And then, and then you get a you get a a, 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 a Roman writer around the second century. Or no, I'm sorry, the third century, who claims that the the uh, cult of Serapis combined with the cult of Christians. Oh, and he, there, there it is. He, right here's there. Serapis. They said that the Christian bishops would would pay offerings to that statue right there that you you can see. Sorry, who said that? I, I yeah. missed that. Let me I missed pull it up. While he's pulling up, everybody subscribe just, um, Subscribe right now. Gio, you cannot get in the way of the subscriptions. That's the important been, thing right now. Interrupting me all night everybody long. subscribe to break Strong the rules aspect. and click click the bell and add a like. The like helps the algorithm. So add the like and this will rise. Gio, go ahead. No more Gio harassment, I'm I swear. Se- okay, thank you. I'm skeptical of any claim that proposes a hard and fast and, and sort of linear genealogy between the sort of Egyptian pantheon and then later Rome and then Greece or Greece or then Rome and then later Christianity, because I would say that the scholarship presented a lot of it became a distortion among, let's say, uh, European mystery cult, not um, Masonic sources and so forth during the 19th century. A lot of it was sort of like trying to concoct this lineage between European mystery schools in ancient Egypt. And it's like, that's why I'm inherently skeptical of that claim. I think that the problem is that Egypt was sufficiently gone past in the way of their actual belief in Pantheon by the time of the Romans and then later Christ. I, I just, I, mm. I, I would be, I would take that claim with a grain of salt. Try, well, the, grain, uh, this... tra- grain of salt trying to, you know what I mean? Link yes. it up to ancient Egypt. I think that we have to be skeptical of some well, of those. The Serapis would you agree, part. Tyler, or? That's the important part, the Serapis, yeah. I think. I don't know. Oh, well, I mean, Sorry. maybe. We're supposed to talk about Serapis here? Yes. And uh, once again, <laughs> patreon.com slash break the rules. Become a patron today. Listen, people, we got a new patron, uh, I think, yesterday. And it's very important that the patrons keep coming. You're going to get a lot of great prizes from becoming a patron. For $10, <laughs> no, for $5, you are going to get MP3s of the episodes after they come out, patron exclusive streams. For $10, no, for t- <laughs> for $20, you are going to get the magnets, beautiful magnets created by my father, Alexander Polyakov. They are quite a thing of beauty and for $30 you are going to get a beautiful geo magnet no it's <laughs> geo a geo print you're going to get a beautiful be print <laughs> it's going to take uh, the entire refrigerator <laughs> i'm just joking oh my god <laughs> <laughs> what oh my god I'm sorry. You, fucker. you had to fucking say that what? I'm sorry. It was right there. No, I had to grab. Right it was right there. That was there. clever. That was <laughs> clever. I gotta admit, that was clever. All right. Oh, you didn't hear that, Nostic? No, I didn't hear. What did you say? I said maybe you should maybe you should make a geo magnet. And Love is like, well, I'll take the whole refrigerator off. <laughs> you fucker. By the way, this oh, is man. this is what the magnets. <laughs> This is what the magnets look like. No, let me do that again, but like I'll do the Ethan Ralph version. What'd you say to me, motherfucker? <laughs> <laughs> that was my god, but that was fucking fast, bro. Um, anyways, let's. Yeah, and here and here's the hold on, hold on one second, one second, Geo. Here is the beautiful, uh, here is the beautiful Geo uh, print in action from the TFW No GF series. It is quite a thing of beauty. So uh, become a patron today, and you will get this beautiful, beautiful uh, print. And fifty dollar patrons get all of the above. Plus they get a Warhammer 40k figure from Jules P. Hamilton. Plus they get another painting from Geo. Plus they get 
either if they're a fan of sticks, they can get this beautiful sticks dragon, or they can get a custom magnet. By, uh, by the way, Geo, there is a custom work, not a magnet, but a custom woodwork. My father is working in right now for a patron who is, uh, you know, a very, uh, a, a very big fan of Diana. And the oh. specific statue of Diana, you know, the one with the bow and arrow. So oh, my yeah. dad is drawing Diana on this beautiful piece of wood. Uh, the um, uh, what was it called? Kiparis. Uh, they uh, cypress, cypress wood. Cypress wood, yeah. Yeah. So we got a cypress wood, and anyway, uh, Neil. Yeah, you want me to read it for you? Take it away. Yes, take it away, okay, buddy. Okay. So this is a letter to Hadrian, by the way. So this is in the second century. Uh, I'm trying to find the name of the actual author. It's in the, it's in the later. It's in the edition called the later, um, later lives of the Caesars. Um, so it has a. It's a, it's it's the Historia Augusta. Now, I'm going to preface this by saying scholars are very skeptical of taking this as a good source. It's very biased source. All right, so there you go. So I'm telling you that right now. So before you jump down my throat, but it does say this, so it does need to be said, and it says he's, this is what he writes. The Egyptians, whom you are pleased to commend to me, I know thoroughly from a close observation, to be a light, fickle, inconstant people, changing with every turn of fortune. The Christians among them are worshippers of Serapis, and those calling themselves bishops of Christ scruple not to act as votaries of that God. The truth is there is no one, whether ruler of a synagogue or Samaritan or presbyter of Christians or mathematician or astrologer or magician that does not do homage to Serapis. The patriarch himself, when he comes to Egypt, is by some compelled to worship Serapis, and by others, Christ. It is a race of men of all most seditious, vain, and mischievous. Hadrian went on to found his own dying and rising mystery called based on the strange death of his lover. And Tanias, while this is a subtext, while, and this is true too. So Hadrian's gay lover, Antonius, dies in Egypt, and he puts up a, a cult Forum right there, a resurrection cult. And they're uh, uh, the writers trying to combine the two, but it, scholars have already debunked this. I'm a, I agree with this. I think it's nonsense. But the, here's the thing, and the reason why I bring it up is because it's being said for a reason. There obviously are people drawing connections between Serapis and, and Jesus as early as the second century, and that's proof right there. Well, I mean, uh, I won't jump down your throat, but I won't say that's proof because that passage, which I've seen referred many times, and again, to your credit, you said this yourself. But I've read several places that was referred to largely as a forgery. That particular passage, it is not a forgery. I don't think it's a forgery. I just think that it's being biased. It's not a forgery. No. I heard that passage was a, a forgery. It was written oh. much later than that. Yeah. Who would forge that though? If Christians wouldn't preserve that text if it was forged. No, and they didn't say they did. But <laughs> that I've again, you said yourself that test. That one is a kind of a testy passage, mm. and I've heard that that letter to Hadrian is uh, largely considered mm. a forgery. There was trace to. Uh, 347 AD, I believe, was the date they came up with. But I haven't looked at that in quite a long time. Well, yeah. the, oh. the most important thing, I think, here is not even this particular passage, but it's more of the idea of can we both agree, can we all agree, that Serapis was a Greco-Egyptian deity that had a very big uh, cult following in Rome? Yeah. Yeah, they had his own temple in Rome. Well, hold on, Tyler. If you have any qualms about this, let's hear them. Well, no, because it's not really central to the argument. So. It's extremely central to the argument because we're talking about the adoption of a dying and rising God, something that is inherent in uh, these Egyptian uh, traditions. I mean, it's Rome. Not, I mean, Davies, for example, when the premier Egyptologist right now, he actually says that resurrection is a completely inappropriate word to describe Egyptian belief. He says that they're essentially ritual optimists believing firmly the word. in, and he, and he puts it into a... Uh, quotations of rejuvenation of the dead which is an individualized embodied self which is a whole purpose and point of the funeral rite which rejoins the soul to the body which is why they don't have cremation but the difference is though is that this isn't like resurrection in the sense of a coming back into body life but the continuing existence a continued existence in a mummified and in that sense only a bodily state after death and then what you don't have in these is you don't have an eschatology apocalypse collective cataclysm no crisis. In other words, death is continuous with life in this view. There's no sense of anastasis, that kind of resurrection that we find in the Christian story. And even if that is the case, that, yeah. that you know, Egyptian beliefs have some kind of apparent physicality for the but departed. Mummies themselves were expected to return to a new life anytime after. 
Right. That's that's what makes Christianity different from those, and no one's no one's arguing that it doesn't. Obviously, there's different. Like like if if they all had those things that you just mentioned, they would be it would be Christianity without Jesus. Like we don't can have. I, can I ask Tyler something? We're arguing. But I will say this sure. real quick, real quick. As far as how big ISIS and Osiris were in Rome, Josephus, when he's writing about when he, you're you're familiar with Book 18, Tyler, obviously with where it talks about now there was a man named Jesus who was called the Christ. The very yeah. next paragraph after that, the very next two pages after that, is about the events in Rome that went down in the temple of temple of Isis and Osiris. All this craziness that was happening, where the priest of uh, one of the priests of Isis rapes a girl, and like he's describing elites in Rome that are committing all these crimes. You wouldn't you wouldn't get that narrative if it wasn't something happening in Rome that was worth being written about. If it was just some tiny little cult in the corner over here. No, these are built, these are uh, funded by the Roman government to build these giant temples of Serapis and Isis and Horus. And I want Gio to respond, but before that, just uh, one final thing about the uh, Isis and Horus and so on and so forth. When we're talking about this particular funerary rite of the mummification and you uh, Tyler, you talked about how the resurrection to the Egyptians was different than the resurrection for the reasons that you stated. Would that mean that the Romans would have treated that resurrection, the Egyptian resurrection, favorably? Because I don't know why, and the Christian resurrection unfavorably. Would there be something that would be more favorable for, for the Romans to, uh, with the Egyptian resurrection as opposed to the Christian? Well, I, I didn't say... Egyptian resurrection. I said they had an idea of continued existence. Of continued exi Okay, that's fine. Would that continued existence of the body be favorable for the Romans as opposed to the resurrection in Christianity? Well, again, I already outlined what the Greco-Roman worldview is at the time among the very disparate kinds of uh, cults and religions there was. But the, the point is, again, Roman has a very syncretistic kind of approach to religions, right? It, it's whether or not it serves the empire. And so you have these kinds of weird mixtures and these deviations from the origins of these myths, but they're usually done in ways that isn't exactly contradictory to the Roman view. No, but this is what I understand then. If we're talking about continued existence being something that the Romans would have taken into their, uh, you know, into their menagerie of different ways of uh, practicing, then why would they look at Christianity any differently when it comes to how they practice? Because you were saying originally that they were, I don't know if disgusted is the right word, but they were not big fans of the Christian resurrection. Meanwhile, here you have Egyptian continuation of life. I'm not going to say resurrection, continuation of life, which, let's face it, if you have a mummy, that's kind of weird. You know, you have the mummy and the mummy continues living, you know, like, why would they take that as something closer to them by than the Christianity. Way, by the way, the Egyptian Book of the Dead specifically uses the word resurrection. That's the word. That's the word of the word. That's probably the where the word comes from, from Egypt. Well, we're going to have to look that up as well. But that's a different word. It's not anastasis, which is the word we're talking about in Homer. That gets carried over later. But uh, no, um, Lev, what were you? Yeah, I got a little distracted. Sure, sure, sure. No, no problem. Okay. They... So my point here is that if we're talking yes are... yes if we're talking about the continued existence in the egyptian faith that would be something that at least as a lay person looking at it from a distance i would say hey why would the romans look at the christian resurrection of the dead any differently than they would look at the Egyptian continued existence? Why would one thing stand out to them as being something that you described earlier in this conversation as being completely antithetical, while the other one, you know, welcome aboard, Isis, welcome aboard, like uh, Neil was talking about all of these various Egyptian cults in the Roman system. So why not welcome aboard Christianity then? Why would it be antithetical to their kind of continued uh, mishmash of uh, all these different faiths? Right. Well, okay. What I said about that, when I said the influence wasn't as big as it's being presented, right? Like the burial customs of ancient Egypt aren't practiced in Palestine or basically any of the areas which most early Christian evidence is found. And the Osiris cult in particular is in something of a decline in the first century. Right. So, um, right. So again, with the Egyptian customs, it's kind of a continuous life but it's like a many-sided form of life like the only thing they're worried about was essentially a second 
death. But when I say that, why wouldn't there be a gas to that compared to the Christian one? Well, I mean, basically from all the evidence we have, from all the philosophers, I mentioned Plato, Epicurean, Stoics, all the right, all the philosophers who wrote against Christianity, people like Celsus who quoted Heraclitus and said that the physical body is worse than done, right? It is actually that they found the whole prospect abhorrent because the whole point of generating good statesmanship was that you had to have a kind of reward in an afterlife, which is where they departed from the Homeric view, right? So, and all these, the mass amount of the matrix of beliefs we have about the Greco Roman world, that time period, 200 to 300 years before and after Jesus, either way, is that it is a kind of salvation for the soul, or in the case of gloomy existence for the soul, but nothing bodily. The Egyptian one is a kind of persistence of life, but in that way, the word resurrection is inappropriate. And even then, the Osiris cult wasn't that big at the time, anyways, in Palestine. Wait, what were you saying earlier about the uh, that particular disgust of the uh, uh, resurrection having to do with the body? Can you repeat that that line again that the you said the Romans said? Yeah, well, well what I said is like you find that attested in several Roman writers, uh, Julian, for example, um, all, all the basic philosophers have taken this from is the whole idea is that the body is a physical prison house, essentially, right? And so the only way to uh, escape that is the soul has to go to the final destination, be that bliss or mm. sorrow. But there is, and again, with the quotes that they're mentioning, they're, the whole idea of returning to this existence, even for the emperors, which is divination, go to live among the stars, is to escape this physical world. They found the idea of returning to it completely abhorrent. That's why the judgment mm. that Plato talks about in the Republic is that you're separating out the good from the bad because Plato's idea here is that justice can't have its fulfillment in the physical world it needs to be the ideal world where the form of justice is actually realized. So in the right. afterlife, you get the perfection, the just that you can't attain in this world. They simply thought attaining that in this world. The was form awesome. of the good illuminates mm. all the other so, ones. So can we contrast that then with the Egyptian view when it comes to mummification, let's say, because at least once again, looking at this from afar, the body is still there with the mummification so you're not ridding yourself of the actual body of the pharaoh or whoever so wouldn't they find that to be equally abhorrent well you, you could maybe suspect that but again like the mummification practices and the idea of continued persistence in some state is kind of vague and even then it doesn't necessitate that they believe that these mummies were up and walking around in a new kind of bodily life i think it's kind of a scarce thing to suggest right that's like a Hollywood interpretation of mummies. Mm, uh, interesting. But again, like, but. yes, but uh, Curse of the Mummy, yeah. But right now, we are still talking about how this is applied to people, even if the people happen to be of the priestly or pharaonic uh, class. We're not talking about how this applies to the actual deities who would rise uh, or who would fall and then rise again. So, Neil, as far as you attributing this specific word of resurrection to a particular Egyptian uh, deity here, do you have it in front or what What do we have? What, what do we have oh, to work with here? Oh, you, the Egyptian Book of the Dead is filled with the word resurrection all over the place. I'm dead. I'm bored again. All that, 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 that motif is constant. No, but Tyler disagrees that that's the word. So how do we get to whether that is or is um, not the word? Let's get. Let's look this up. We can. We can look this up then. That's a good. I, I'm. I, I, I'm open to being wrong about this. I just. I'm just going off the English translation that I have. I could be wrong. I'm not. A, I'm not an expert in Egyptian. I will. I'm down to look this into. But I want to make up one. I want to bring up one point real quick before we move to this subject. I just thought of this. Herodotus. This is back in the fifth century BC. Literally equates Dionysus with uh, with Osiris. He says, "Quote." Egyptians do not do not all worship the same gods in the same way. Only the gods Isis and Osiris, the latter of whom they say is Dionysus, are worshipped in the same manner by all. So why, why am I bringing this up? Well, if Dionysus and Osiris have almost nothing in common, except for a few things that I can see, if you are worship like if you if you get into all the details all in the weeds, there's. There's so many. They're completely different. They look different. They do different things. They die differently. But the archetype is still there between the two. And this is why Herodotus is conflating these two together. So this is happening as far back as the 5th century BC. And I, I'm just pointing out, like, this is what I'm talking about. The same thing Herodotus was was pointing out back then. This was the, the genre, the son of God, savior archetype, a resurrection cult. Okay, so I actually pretty sure I said that. Maybe I... Maybe you didn't hear me, but I did mention that uh, D 
Dionysus as being an infant set upon the throne and reassembled from his heart, and then comes the race of men. I actually do think that is probably based on Osiris's dismemberment. Not anything involved with anything Jews would pick up, but certainly I do agree would be based on Osiris's dismemberment. But what I haven't seen here is savior in any of this. I don't see resurrect. I don't see virgin birth in any one of these stories, whether it be Mithra, Tammuz, I, I, Osiris. Um, um, Romulus, Romulus is born from a vessel of virgin. That's in Livy. Um, I mean, uh, Samel is, I don't, it doesn't really specify she's a virgin, but it does really specify she is like a virtuous woman who is born of a god. Like it's a, it's a god impregnating a woman. And it doesn't say anything about her having any husband before that. So, but there was also well, the, mean, uh, what was Samel's the figure? Impreg- oh, sorry. Samel's impregnated by Zeus. Right, basically taking the form of a lightning bolt, and then yeah, John Sarah tricks him into asking Zeus to reveal his glory, which ends up burning. Yeah, of course, the <laughs> Coom lightning. Of course, all the all the circumstances are different, but we're we're ta- we're talking about specific boxes that are being checked. I think God, can I, God is impressed a, a woman, go, and a and a son of God is being born through that. Geo, go go ahead. It's an argument. I think the the essence of what we're arguing with tonight here is, I think that. And Tyler, you alluded to this. I think the problem is that, Neil, you're taking like really big picture stuff and you want to create, not create, but rather fit uh, these instances here and there, this eclecticism to fit a larger archetypal whole. But in all of that, I don't really see the need to discredit the actual reality of Christ. In saying that maybe predecessors come from the ancient world because these are very broad categories that are being listed here. especially i mean the richard carrier i'm well richard carrier but i think that these are very broad things here and i think that you want to try to grasp a lot of different influences but i I'm, i just don't see how this fits into negating the actual realities of christ in his message i, I just don't you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I'm not even necessarily um, denying the validity of those archetypal statements. I just don't see how this, like, A comes to Z comes to C, and therefore, ergo, Christ is either a fiction or an elaborate concoction. I, I You know what I mean? Like, I, I think... Oh, I get that, what you're saying. And just to, if, yeah. I, if I can quickly respond to that, is I'm not trying right. to debunk and say, I'm not trying to go full-blown Richard Carey and say he doesn't exist. None, none right, of these right, happy. Right, I'm right. saying that he did live, and he did probably do amazing things that blew people away. And he, when people are writing the narrative of him, they've really wanted to capture how great he was and, and looking around the rest of the world. And by the way, so whoever wrote Luke at Luke X or Mark, or these are specific, these are very sophisticated texts. These aren't just random people in a desert with some, with some parchment. This is being done somewhere with scribes who are trained in Greek. And by the way, we know this. I know this from sc- talking to scholars about this particular subject. When you wrote People who are trained to write in Greek were trained to copy Homer. This was part of the training. They would copy Homer. So the the already the people who know Greek and can write in Greek, they know these texts. They know the the Aeneid. They know the Livy. They know all these texts. They already. It's not like it's that crazy to say that whoever's writing the Gospels is hmm. influenced by the rest of the world somehow. That's I want to I want to do right, a quick whether, quote by the how way. How long those influences hmm. go back? I think that. It's highly well, here's an example. Right. So legend has it that a double rainbow, what does it mean? A double rainbow and a glowing new star appeared in the heavens to herald the birth of, who do you think I'm talking about? The 80s. No, Kim Jong-il. In 1942, oh, yeah, that on North Korea's... You know there's a story from 157 <laughs> BC that says a star signifies the birth of a world savior and magi, I don't know if it says three or not, I know it says magi, Magi are following the star to find it. It's the it's the birth of King Mithridates VI. Hmm. But my point, bringing this Kim Jong Il thing up, is not to equate Jesus with King Jong Il, but it's the idea that you could have people who are very uh, well known who do certain things, whether it's you know great things or horrible things. There's a cult of personality that develops, which then starts bringing in other things around them to solidify, kind of like this ideal image, exactly this mythology. Saying. That's exactly what I've been saying the whole time. 
I'm not saying they're copying them, but I'm, but just this is how like when when people who write music when they start putting music together, they're bow, they're they're even if it's even if it's uh, subconsciously, they're borrowing from the music that they already know. That's how we do things. Yeah, this is all utterly insane to me. I mean, so far I haven't heard any. And same with Carrier's List, by the way. I'm familiar with it. Every single one of these gods mentioned didn't have a virgin birth. Other than maybe Romulus, who was impregnated by um, the, uh, his mom that, was impregnated by the I god. Didn't say mom. they all did. You, you, I know you're not. But let me finish. Put my spin. You do. You, specific, you you choose one thing, and then you focus on that one little thing. But yeah, they, but all of them have one of those. All of them have yeah. a few of those characteristics. If you have to make a meaningful parallel here, though. And all these kind of gods, whether it be salvation, which none of them have, like the Christians. That's not true at all. Luciania Mysteries offer salvation. Not the same kind. I already yes, elaborated it is. When you're initiated in the Luciania Mysteries, you get eternal life. That is not bodily resurrection. I've to- I already explained that to you. It doesn't what- matter. It's a mystery. Yeah, it does God does matter. Not because, the whole- because the Jews don't even believe in bodily resurrection. So why would that matter? If you're talking about this as being just a Jewish thing. If the Jews don't even believe that, then why should that matter? At Wrong. All? First of all, the Cameron community did. The Pharisees did. Not, the Sadducees did not. Did not. The yeah. Sadducees interpreted it. Or the priests. Hold on. The Sadducees interpreted it as a political imminent coming upcoming reality. They didn't interpret right. it as a physical body resurrection. Pharisees did. Many other ones did. Maccabees, Cameron community. But the point is, is the idea of a hope of resurrection tied to the fulfillment of the covenant in Israel is where you get the tradition of bodily resurrection from. That makes sense in that matrix. But in the dying and rising God sense, I said, we keep using that term as if it's real. It isn't. I already said at the beginning, many of them disappear. Other of them appear, replay other. Other of them die. Other of them go to other space. Examples of ones that come back and raise the dead with them. I gave you a bunch of examples. Yeah, but, that's not, this, one. but that's not similar to... Wait, wait, hold on. Uh, Tyler, Tyler, no, Tyler you of... says he gave you one uh, Gnostic informant. What were the ones that you gave him? What For, for, for what specifics? For the resurrection. I gave you a Nana. I gave okay, you what else? Dian- uh, um, Osiris. Okay, that's two. Any more? And then you have Eleusinian Mysteries, Persephone. You got Demeter. I mean, the 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 the, uh, the, the, the Astarte cult was it was in Phoenicia. That's a different one. There's they're they're equivalents, but they're the same. It's all coming from the same mythos. There's a whole bunch of them. Ishtar, right, I- Nana, Astarte, uh, Osiris, uh, Eleusinian Mysteries. Who is the gentleman that we said was also born of the virgin, but it, no, it was born of the rock, and Mithra. he was already he, yeah he was already offers, adult. Mithra offers salvation in his initiation. It's not the same way. It's not through his death. I get that. I'm I'm acknowledging the differences, but what I'm saying is that there's a there's a is a genre of salvation. Hmm. Of, 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 of I would I, I would make the analogy at least at least for me yeah. the analogy would be the way that the difference between the way that you guys look at it is that Tyler you look at the end product whether we're talking about the uh, wine having to do with uh, you know uh, Jesus Christ standing for something completely different than having these orgiastic uh, mystery cult uh, dances. That is the end product. I view that personally, and I know that I'm a bit biased here, but that's why we got Geo. Uh, I view that as being the flower instead of the stem or the root. And the stem of the root, the process from which these are created, I would look at, for example, this figure being born of the rock. The, even though he's not a baby, he's not the baby Jesus, he's already a full man. It's still like something that comes out from not a human conception. That I view more as being the stem and the root as far as the introduction to these uh, mythologies as opposed to what the end product is. And I think that's what that's the problem that Neil has with your interpretation, Tyler, is that, at least according to Neil, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you look at the uh, details of what comes, what is the end result that comes afterwards, not so much about whether the processes themselves have a lot to do in common and may share, you know, I'm not saying like a direct lineage, but maybe something in the ether, maybe something that people would pick up and introduce into the mythology of uh, Jesus Christ. I never said that Christianity copies these, these, these cults, but I'm saying that there's influencing going on. That's what I've been saying the whole time. Right. Okay. For, that's not what I said, Lev, though. What I'm saying is 
the kind of details you're trying to establish to say that you can even look at a finished product and say they identified is simply not present in the original stories once you look at their context. The only way you could try to draw any kind of parallel, whether you want to say it's archetypes or direct, I know Neil doesn't want to say it's direct, is if you take them out of a context, like saying that somebody coming out of a rock or fully grown man is exactly the same thing as a virgin birth. The context of Mithraism, at least in the Roman variety of it, is a zodiacal. Do you want it's, to about, it's largely about the zodiac. There's no notion of salvation there. What the inscription I already showed you, where we get the notion of right. salvation. You know what's so ironic about it. this? You know what's so ironic about what you just said is that Christianity itself, what it, to, to get Christianity to be the fulfillment of the Old Testament, you have to take out the Old Testament out of context to make Christianity be the fulfillment of the Old Testament. There's, I mean, you have to disregard the Torah. You have to take little verses that say. Like she born of a young woman, that's about literally about Isaiah's wife, not and that's the context of it. Take that one little sentence out of context and say, Oh, look, says born of a virgin in the Greek version, not the Hebrew, by the way. And then you have to take Psalms out of context where they're talking about Israel being surrounded by Nebuchadnezzar and its army. And then there's a part where it says surrounded like a lion, but then it gets translated into Greek, says he's surrounded, uh, they pierced my hands and feet take that one sentence out of context and make that a prophecy about Jesus when it really what it was talking about was Israel being surrounded by Nebuchadnezzar. So the, the irony of you telling me that I have to take this out of context is hilarious because Christianity is taking the Old Testament out of context for it to work. Okay, well, aside from sidestepping that with throwing an argument that's not even what we're talking about right now, although as I already said earlier, early Christians retroactively, just like I said in the last stream with the Shema prayers, they understood Jesus within that context, right? Just because later Jewish scholars disagree, that's a whole other issue, but I'm not talking about that. What I'm saying is Mithraism isn't to have a notion of salvation. The notion of salvation and the only inscription of Roman Mithraism we have is salvation from the from the bull that Mithra slays, and these are zodiac motifs. There is no right. notion of salvation. In fact, Mithra doesn't even die. Now the, I the Roman I didn't say he did. I know, I know, but I'm saying in order to keep the parallels that you're trying to make, you have to be able to show that they exist. But like carriers and all that, once you go down, like Virgin birth, oh, well, that's not really there, right? Osiris, well, his body gets scattered and reanimated in the underworld, but it's not really the same kind of thing, right? And the word used in resurrection in the Egyptian book, that it's not the same word, which is anastasis, which is the concept of from Homer, so that you so find that. Well, I'm just, I'm just, and I'm not saying you're wrong about that, but I want to make this clear. So you're saying that the, the English translations that use the word resurrection for the Egyptian book of the dead, those are all wrong? I'm saying it, it can be ambiguous if you don't understand the different context of the Greek word and concept of resurrection. Because when we're doing translation, it's not just the word, it's the social context. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Well, but wait, your claim is that Tyler has to occlude totally the Jewish tradition in order to make his case. Like, what do you mean by that? Like, he has to basically get rid of the mm. imports from Judaism in order to make a point about Christianity. Like, what do you mean by, like, you made it about Tyler specifically or Christian apologetics. Are you talking about talking to me? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, you, sorry. I said that. I was looking something up. Say that again. You said that um, Tyler and other people, uh, Christian apologists basically have to overwrite or completely cut away or occlude the Jewish tradition in order to make their case for the validity of the Christ story. I mean, if, yeah, basically, because Christianity, to make Christianity fit the old, as, a, as the fulfillment of the Old Testament, you have to take the Old Testament out of context into wh whatever context you want it to be, and which is... Mm. But this isn't even something that we need to... What do you mean, though? To... What do you mean by that? Like, specifically, like, do you, mm. do you mean, like, like so, so that's I, a pretty huge claim is what I'm saying. Yeah, well, well it is, of course. Well, Nastik talked about several things. I mean, this isn't, this is not even something that I think needs to have any back and forth debate over. This is a very simple process. We can just look at, if ta if uh, Neil said yeah. that look at the Hebrew, and this is what the Hebrew says, and then compare it to later, would that not be enough to establish that he is correct? I mean, maybe not Tyler. Like, like I don't know. Like, what would be if if Neil like, was right about these Hebrew words? Then why would that not establish that as being? And I know we're kind of going away from the resurrection, which uh, I feel is kind of a shame because there was the last point that I wanted to ask about that. But if there is anything you want to say regarding the Hebrew, uh, I mean, let me know. I mean I mean, not really. Neither of us are Hebrew scholars. This was not what we agreed to talk about. We we're That's talking true. about dying and rising gods. And yes. frankly, 
if, if that's what we were I, talking about. I, I did add, add that as oh, a bonus, though. Talk about it. It's fine. I'd... Yeah. Just so you know, I did that. add that as a bonus in the DM. I said bonus, I like we may, we may talk about that. I bring that. on Hebrew scholars to talk about these things. Yeah, all I, 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 I you know bring on that. Jewish Hebrew scholars. I know, and, no, I have Christians well, coming. I have Dallas Ellison coming on next month, uh, two weeks. And I'll say there is there is debates over these things, right? It's not like there isn't when it comes in within biblical studies. There's debates between like N.T. Wright and Mark Kinzer on the question of Messianic Judaism and the Old Testament. Like, it's a common debate. It's not unanimous across the board. But yeah, yeah. yes, either way, that's not really what we're here to talk yes. about. But back to the uh, falling and rising gods, there was something I wanted to ask regarding uh, the uh, birth of Christ. And uh, Neil, I believe that there was something related to the birth of Christ that you wanted to discuss here as well, right? As far as the connection between the uh, pagan mystery cults of uh, incorporating the equinoxes incorporating all of these astrological things do you see a connection between jesus and these things as well well i think the early church obviously did by putting his birth on december 25th that's just that the early church is seeing this or what i'm seeing obviously that's it's not it doesn't say that in the text it's not really born on december 25th that's an astrological thing that's where the winter solstice is uh the 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 fact that he resurrects on easter the sunday following the paschal moon the fact that that day changes every year what does that tell you are we really celebrating his his resurrection or are we celebrating a specific astrological date that changes why does it change every year you ever you ever thought about that that's that's astrological that that's pure purely astrological unless it, if there was a specific date it would stay the same every single year but it doesn't it's based off the paschal moon so that tells you right there this is is very much tied to the ancient world of of astrological and even maybe agricultural because it's the start of the new year it's the start of resurrection the plants well, are- uh, well t- tyler what do you think well on the first thing december 25th i mean it's just of no relevance that was way later they deposited that date and even then there was direct competition with uh you know stolen victus and that mm-hmm. the original date the original early church actually did pause it was january 6th that is one of the earlier traditions you you find that with others like saint stephen but it's simply just you know irrelevant. I don't think that's true either because mm, January sixth. I think there's some illusion in the text of it being sort of around October, to based on the the event what's happening taking place when her birth is. I think it's alluding towards there's a harvest happening. So that's what I th- that's what I think. I mean I could be wrong about that. No, I no, I see your point. I, I've yeah. actually seen that argued before. I've seen June argued. Uh, uh, yeah, I, no, I see your point there. All yeah. I'm saying is it's not really anything that mm. concerns what we're talking about. What about uh, what about the Easter time? Sorry, what what is the question exactly? You, yeah, I want to uh, I want to hear what do you think about Jesus's resurrection day changing every year? Why is that? If it's That's not it logical, really? what? I mean, what is there a date that he resurrected, or is it based on the Paschal moon, which is the spring equinox? Well, I mean, they give it a date, yeah. You know? Every year it changes, though. It's based on an astrological event, right? Well, I mean, we have a liturgical calendar, but I'm not seeing where we're getting astrology in this picture. So, I mean, I, I guess my, I guess uh, if I was a steel man for you, I would say the early church is trying to fit the Christian worldview into the into what's already popular at the time, which was celebrating celebrating the paschal moon or well, that's, the, that's so that the pagans could be make sense of it. I mean, they yeah, no, I, I, I get that, I, yeah. but, 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 but I will, but then on top of that, you have to say that there were some people in the early church who identified these things as being together. So you're saying if the date changes that metaphysically, it means that Christ had to resurrect on different days based on every year. Like he, I don't understand. Yeah. That. Well, it, it does. That's because it doesn't make sense because that's it makes that. Yeah, because it makes a lot more sense for this date to be based on with the position of the sun. But the that's date why of it changes. The resurrection is that one solid date, though. Which yeah. one? Is it the calendar change? That's kind of. I don't understand. No, no. Okay, okay. Can you confirm, Neil? Can you confirm that the date changes every year yeah. for Easter based on the moon, as you were saying? Can we make that I'm connection? I'm the only one here that knows this. That Easter changes every year. It's not the same every year. No, but it, does it change? Yeah, no, but doesn't change yeah. because. Yeah. because but, but does it change because of the liturgical dates? No, no, it very changes, easy. It changes because of the Paschal moon of the spring. Can equals. we confirm that? Can we confirm it changes because well, of the Paschal what moon? Cha- what else is it based on? Okay, Tyler, what else is it based on? So is the resurrection? And I know this, that it's, it's different for Orthodox and Catholics. So yeah, the Orthodox, they celebrate in the 7th, the old Catholic. Yeah. 
called. But still, yeah. they're, they're both b- basing their date on some sort of equation that has to do with the spring equinox. Otherwise, why is it there every year? Oh, I thought they, they, they counted six months from a certain time when they devised that. Like according to Jewish tradition, they counted it that way. Not anything astrological. But there's early speculation about that, though. Some of them put it at different dates, but you don't find a solid tradition until quite a bit later. Sure. Well, let me look, let me look it up. Does Easter change every year? Uh, look, this is getting monotonous. Honestly, like this is not what we're here to talk about. Like, if we get back to the subject, or are we done? Well, well, all right. Well, one last thing. Okay, but I but I just want to read what I searched here because it takes time to uh, type things on. I don't want to take it for granted. Uh, The take the date of Easter Sunday falls on the first Sunday after the first moon, following the vernal equinox in March. There you go. So that is why Easter changes. That's the Uh, most important point, though. I get that. Fine, that's fine. But to to bring it back, which by the way, it breaks the Ten Commandments. To the uh, this the it's breaking the commandment of the sabbath which is completely like i said before we're taking the old testament out of context to make the new one fit but here's the question though what are the odds that the messiah of the of the of the, of the jewish world the jewish messiah who's fulfilling the torah happens to be resurrecting and the same weekend is inanna who dies for three days and resurrects the dead with her why is that what, I, mean, just, I just want to know what what do you how is that what are the odds well, it's you like a Wrestle Kingdom WrestleMania in the same weekend. It's kind of. <laughs> but I think it, I think it, my point is, is got to be valid to some degree. There's got to be some degree of validity on my point. But here. no, but again, like that's the point. I think me and Tyler are trying to make is that that's if they had to adopt certain elements of the pagan tradition in order to make them understand, in order to fit their worldview. Then that's so what I've been it. saying the whole time. But, no, but then I mean, why? Like, but then why wouldn't the I, church? Okay, when I went okay. to Catholic school, the most important thing. Is that you know it was the first Sunday that was like the, yeah you know what I mean like that's the spirit yes. of the date rather than like the actual the material actuality of the date is in terms of how it changes every year based on the Gregorian calendar is kind of like not. My brain is frying right now. Please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, l- last thing before God yeah 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 okay last thing yeah. before we finish this uh, up and this is a fascinating Lev, I discussion. Very eager to feed into any anti-Christian argument here. Lev, do you have a particular perhaps <laughs> ethnic or religious interest in the, into why that is? I don't know. My 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 my, int- my interest is because break the rules is supposed to be a show where we get different people together to talk about different <laughs> things, and for a long time it's only been of I one you're, point you're, of view. Your eyes per- <laughs> <laughs> comes up with a point, an epic own against Christianity. It's only been, listen, Gio, you know this as much as I do. It's only been one point of view regarding so many of these things I'm, for about a year I'm now. I'm the and, fact I'm in Tyler's corner, okay? Like, that's uh, my, yes, no, I appreciate that. Anyway. Okay, so Tyler brought up good points when it comes to there were not these same examples of the specific, uh, let's see, so... With the with the rock, for example, that's not a it's a virgin birth. But do you have anything better, uh, Neil? Do you have any better virgin birth than just like oh this rock over here Mithra came out of? That's oh. number one. And number two, we have to get to the salvation question, which Tyler brought up, which I think is also very important. These are I think the two important things. So number one, the any examples of virgin birth, and number two, can we get the direct source of where it talks about the salvation? I'm done. Well. Th- then that's we're just going to go over what we just talked about by what you just that, that we already talked. This is all stuff we've already went over. And I did say that the closest thing to the virgin birth would be would be Romulus being born of one of the Vestal virgins. OK, but that's just one. See, my problem no, is I, that I've been saying that. The yeah. whole time is that. Yeah. This if you, if you take all of them one by one, there's they're not all a equals a. They're all they all have certain archetypal traits that make them the logos or whatever mm. son of god or okay certain all right things. so the, you put I, them all together as a venn diagram you get jesus in the middle okay right. last last question then is the salvation question when it comes to mithraism or whichever else is there any other example that you can show here or even the example of mithra but do we have the source to say this is how the salvation works yeah i, I have mary beard's um Religions of Rome. This is if anyone wants to see where oh, I am. Oh God! Oh no! no, no, no oh God! No. Oh please, please no! You don't like, you don't like Gary Beard? <laughs> oh, no, we're sacrificing Geo over but here. She, 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 literally is looking at the 
Um, because with Mithra, you don't have physical certain bits. aspects she does not, all right. The rest is bullshit. You, with yeah. Mithra, you have all carvings on stone and stellies and and she has pictures. I mean, the, you can look at this for sh- stuff for yourself. And it's initiation rites. It's the initiation rites. It's basically a Persian version of the Lusianian mysteries. Your initiation and the Mithra, Mithra killing the bull is what gives salvation to the initiate. So you do a mock but, imitation. But the initiate. That's the important point. The initiate. Oh, I know. I've said that. And not, I said that. The initiate. Not, but in Christianity, cool. baptism is initiation. That's the yes, but it's initiation that's open to everyone. It's something yeah. that is fundamental to Christianity. It's not and I agree. that is that's given in, as a part of a ritual, as a mystery call. Sure, and that's why right. Christianity, as a polemic, would say this is why we're better than that. This is why we're the we're the world savior. This is why Christianity. Yes, because there's so many hazards in terms of, and okay, let's just just the raw practicality politically in the ancient world. There's so many problems with mystery cults. There's so many problems spiritually with mystery cults as well. Why Christian would say, listen, we have to get rid of these things sure. because they're a danger to most people for a variety of reasons. Same like why I had the, they had to get rid of the Gnostics. So Tyler, please jump in. I'm cutting you off. Yeah. I, I, again, I'm really running out of time here, but I'll just say one quick thing on this. Oh, uh, one thing I noticed you said is, you know, Persian. I mean, you talked about myth where you talk about the, the slaying of the bull. Well, that's where it comes it's, from. But he's, he was in It doesn't, actually. Um, this is a very not- out... Yes, it is. This is very outdated. This comes from Franz Kumon, who originally tried to posit that Roman Mithraism and, and Iranian Mithraism had an essential continuity. And so what he tried to do... That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying... Okay, we're gonna, can I finish a point here? Right. The point okay. is, is the bull slaying scene doesn't come from iranian mithraism there's no continuity between the two other than the name this is an outdated thing where people like georgiani still think it's a thing where you try to connect <laughs> persian mithraism and roman mithraism the two cults are nothing identical unless we want to say mithra had like a midlife crisis before he became the roman mithraism but other than that they're not I identical there's no notion of a bull now what i said is again the only inscription we have for salvation when it comes to the bull is salvation from the bull which mithra then kills right these are zodiac symbols but what you do have, and to your point, is from like, you know, like mid second century onwards, the fourth Mithraism is one of the main competitors to Christianity. And so you do actually have similarity in art, right? An example is where that's kind of like, you know, Pepsi and Coke going at it, right? They're fighting, right? They're trying to outdo each other. So there is a sense of competition between the two that's that you find with the whole time. Right, right. But again, but that does not establish the connection of an archetypical parallel which is more along the lines of like a Raglan kind of archetype. But you wouldn't to say so, but I, th- that's where I think that's where I think you're wrong. Cause I think if, if you're like Pepsi and Coke would be two different, two different separate drinks, but one archetype competing against each other. Yeah. But I'm saying when we're that's talking about, the, sh- they don't look right? the same. They don't, they're not the same. Again, I, I'm saying in regards to the competition between the two, and we, sh- we find shared similarity along how they depict certain scenes. But I'm, that's not the same claim as the dying and rising God claim, which is, as I already showed, none of them even rise. They go to the underworld or something else. To establish that, you need to have to establish with the Nana does rise. And I, I don't know you keep saying none of them rise. And Nana rises with the dead. She comes back to the world and resurrects the dead with her. That's so a specific a, thing. Well, a different kind. Romulus rises back from the dead and saves Rome. He rises back up. He ascends to the Father and comes back and saves Rome. I mean, there are they, they just they they're, they're they're just like yeah. They, some of them don't rise. Some of them just go to heaven, and some of them have a successor on the earth who who do it for them. That's another thing. But yeah, you but can argue that that's similar to Christianity itself, be the Father and the Son. Right. The, the point is, you have to establish similarities in with more detail because this is why the dying and rising God category is rejected unanimously. Is because no, it was not it is who holds it. A lot of people do. Such as? Uh, okay. Do you- and not Robert Price, Richard Carrier, yeah, Thomas. So they don't count because you don't like, because they. No, they I, I'm, saying, I'm saying because they're. You the said three. unanimously. If you want to say that most biblical scholars don't hold to it, I would probably agree. You probably do re- agree. Exactly. Well, you do realize that dying and rising gods in biblical studies is basically like six day creationism. That's Dennis biology. McDonald. Do you know who Dennis McDonald is? Dr. Dennis McDonald? Kind of sounds familiar. Uh, Robin, Robin Faith Walsh. Um, let's see who else. Um, I mean, I, I just I, I have to I'd have to like. Well, see, they do I tend to reference each list other. Names of biblical awesome. scholars in front of me. I bet you I can name off five or six of them right now. But this point, this pointless. That doesn't. What, what matters is the argument. It doesn't matter who thinks what. 
Well, man, okay, well, I already answered it. Like I, I, I went through Mithra, Dionysus, how many of these I, I needed to do. I explained. I explained it in the matrix of what they thought the soul was. The Egyptians didn't have a view of body resurrection. It was specific. continued for long existence where there's right. a kind of continuity. And but that's the point one is a specific thing, though. That's one difference Christian, that I agree yeah. with you on. But every yeah, but everything else, there's no similarities. There's no virgin birth. There's instances like Romulus where he's pregnant, uh, his mother gets pregnant by the god Mars. But none of these stories are unanimous in any kind of archetypical parallel. If you have to stretch those parallels to that point, you could basically do things like say, and I've seen people do it with the same kind of line of reasoning, put uh, Kennedy on it, Lincoln, Churchill, all these kinds of things, right? So it, the, the point is, is you have to understand that a lot of the issues with Christianity was not because they were trying to appeal to this kind of pantheon of gods. It didn't fit into that archetype. They were uh, they were actually told that they're atheistic because they didn't hold to that syncretistic view and mix it with all these other religions, mythologies that it was kind of common in the Greek Roman And the, their opponents, like Celsus and the like, and the pagans, explicitly said that they they deny their resurrection of the body. They think it's crazy, right? And so when I mean, you don't have the details, wait, 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 wait. What, about what about Justin Martyr, who says that literally this is Justin Martyr, who's be arguing on your side saying that all these other gods that look like jesus were from demons inventing them that's literally in the in his reputation of the is that what it's called reputation of the heresies i think it's called of or, all yeah yeah that justin martyr and then he says that jesus is just like another jupiter he didn't well, say that actually i don't know that's kind of he didn't no he no, did like he, he did talk about he did talk about logos and earlier these earlier like right gods. exactly right. And he's well, again, same with August again, and Aquinas. Again, I mean, and this is a stupid point. Why should I care what a second century Platonist philosopher apologist is going to tell us about the history of religions? Because that's they, not, the, the people he was responding to were saying that their view of bodily resurrection is not going to happen. It's abhorrent. And Justin Martyr saying, well, I'm a philosopher. I'm going to appeal to them on their level. So I'm going to do the Platonic right. thing. And so his, that's the point. But the whole but his the whole, defense to the whole God thing. rising gods as a strong category is trying to show that there's a continuity of death and resurrection that Jesus' story matches onto. It doesn't match onto them in virgin birth, doesn't match onto them in bodily resurrection, doesn't match up to them in passion narratives, doesn't match onto them into the worldview. There's no sense of Platonic soul, there's no sense of Homer, there's no sense of the Greek or Roman pantheon. Yes, you have is. no leg to stand on. Yes, there is. But death gave up your Death gave up its dead, and Hades gave up its dead. Kingdom of Arenos is at hand. I mean, the uh, the fact that the fact that he blames the demons for making all these other religions tells you everything you need to know. Justin. What's wrong with that? A lot because, of Orthodox people believe that. He's not denying that they're there, but he has to make up some sort of. A lot of the ancient gods do come off like demons. I don't know. How it's well, gonna... that's if that's all it does is show that that was a concern at the time already. Giga Chad, yes, Neil. Yes. Yeah. Anyways, I, oh, I wanted to ask Tyler something uh, before we go. This came up from. Okay, listen. Lo, no, actually, let me address this seriously. Gnostic inform. I do understand that antipathy towards explaining away because there is a lot of like. LARPy trad casts and trad orthos nowadays that do explain everything away like ufos are demons this is a demon that's a demon that's a demon i and i agree with that criticism but i do think that there is something to be said about how a lot of those the ancient pantheons of gods do fundamentally contradict with christian theology to the point where you would say yeah that kind of looks like a demon you know zeus fucking uh young girls and giving them golden showers and pretending to be you know geese and uh, in order to impregnate well, that's a real and... that's made out of real gold. Just just so we're clear, Geo, this isn't like a uh, you know. Piss yeah, I this just is, yeah. I, I I you know what I mean. Like I understand the criticism of not calling everything demonic, but I I think that you get what I'm saying. I'm trying to give you a serious answer here. And I but... and, and my answers my answer has been the same the t the whole time. It's that I'm not saying that Christians are copying these other religions or that they're all no, the same. No, I know. I, I'm just. And I just I don't, yeah, I, I just... I just keep saying that. And like it's like Prometheus. He sacrifices himself for the for the soul he, for for humanity. That's not the same as getting res, getting crucified. People say that Prometheus was crucified. No, that's the big mistake that mythicists always tend to make. Look at look at Lev. But the the thing is the 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 connection is Prometheus sacrifices himself for humans. Not he's not crucified. He's not dying and rising. It's just a couple. It's just a small archetype there. When you look at all of these together in one big picture, you see. 
that the world was looking for a savior. The world wanted a savior, and Christianity was able to give them that. They wanted a savior by saying it would be abhorrent to have returned to physical resurrection, and the only option was the Isle of Blessedness or actual immortality to the stars. Or oh, No, they didn't. That was their refutation of Christianity. I would think, but the, to your point, though, um, this, again, gets into a wider question, which we're, we haven't addressed at all, and frankly, we'll have to do it some other time, but why Christianity managed to survive. Because my point is that it doesn't fit into this matrix. It's very much against it, actually. And the very same things you're saying, like, for example, okay, well, not, not all these stories are identical. Sure, we can go with that. But then why keep them as one category? Because we have to understand them on their own terms. And we've, we've elucidated on what some of those terms are. I just don't understand why I keep them. I could see, for example, like in the case of Mithraism from mid-2nd century onwards, even though there's plenty of differences between them. There is a bit of competition and there's likeness in arts, but there's not similarity in terms of belief or the actual details, right? Or what they were, right? I mean, Mithraism was very much a initiation call. There's for men only or Zodiac. So I just don't see why holding on to this category of dying, rising gods, if it's been shown not to even be universal among those that James Fraser cites. And this is in Christian saying this, by the way, or apologists. This comes from people like Jonathan Smith and others who write very typically anti-Christian literature about, uh, you know, basically try to do what you're doing. They try to undermine the historical historicity of Christ, but they nonetheless affirm that, that there is no category of dying, rising gods in Fraser's understanding. So I could go with you, Neil. I could say, yeah, there is deliberate attacks, but I mean, Paul deliberately attacks the Stoics. He, he names, he directly brings them up. There is uh, very direct things from the fathers answering people like Celsus, where they're actually going against, debating the merits of bodily resurrection versus the pagan view of the soul. We know that they disputed these things. So it's not like there's a likeness. They never said, like Justin Martyr never said, oh, we're just one of you. Even he, I'm picking him as the most extreme example. He went with a Christianized Platonism, Platonism, but he was saying, I have access to like what Plato was really hoping you'd get over against you guys. But nonetheless, there is still no attempt to say, or by Paul or any of the fathers that this is just like Osiris or uh, Dionysus or whatever. And and this is another thing that we forgot to bring up that I think do you, that you I don't think you realize this is that the earliest Christians, not all of them believed in the same bodily resurrection. A lot of them did have a Gnostic. Uh, this, this we need to escape this reality for the Pleroma. That was a f common worldview, especially in the Christians in Rome, the Valentinians, as early as the second century. Just because the Pauline Christians won out doesn't mean that they all thought that way in the beginning. There was a lot uh, of differences. Yeah, I actually very familiar with this. So I don't know why you would assume I wasn't, but I, I did mention the last stream about Gnosticism and second century. I dated the Gnostic text. I also went, although before uh, Miguel, I was like, well, this doesn't really matter, but I did go over in say Odyssea and as well as Rome, the geography of heresy, when these kinds of groups actually first started appearing, right? We do have continuity with the first century. This is basically what you're reiterating is what's called the Bauer thesis, which is that the original Christianity was somehow diverse and that Pauline Christianity run out. I mean, this is simply not true. I mean, second no, century. It's it, definitely it is, diverse. Definitely diverse. Yeah. It's, uh, source what? Trust me, bro. Like this has been refuted. No, no, no. Bart Ehrman wrote a whole book about this called Lost Christianity. David Litwall. I, I, just I've read it. Bart Ehrman's book on it. He's been criticized. Was, Bart Ehrman, by the way, is a serious, respectful scholar, but he yeah. actually himself admits that in that viewpoint, he is in the minority. Does that mean it's automatically wrong because of the arguments? Uh, no, I'm just saying we haven't gotten to this co conversation yet, but the Bauer thesis was something that comes out of the early history of religion school and has since been very well moved on. Like, for example, Gnostic groups, they're largely syncretistic. They came much later in the second century. There is proto-Gnosticism. Like I was just going to say that. They're not all like, in the second century. The Christians. Yeah, like the Docetists and the like. There is some precursors, but the kind of Gnosticism we get in the second century, which is what you're alluding to, is very different from the ones... Say, for example, in the New Testament or the Gospel of John, like the point is, in those view, creation is still inherently good. In the second century, we have a kind of radical Paulinism that says uh, creation is not inherently good. The whole thing is bad. You have an anti-cosmic dualism. And basically, they take from a variety of syncretistic views and mix them together into this kind of anti-cosmic dualism. It's a certain version of Platonism. And one thing I will say, by the way, about that which I didn't mention on the last stream, because again, I'm not, this is a much wider question and we weren't yeah. planning to talk about this, but the neoplatonic pagan philosophers 
are also a source we have on the Gnostics. They write against somebody, yeah. well, Platonus, he never identifies them as a Christian sect, but yeah. he takes them to task, right? So I think it's better too. understood as syncretistic and later developments that come out of uh, well, Orthodox Christianity, yeah. That's fine. I, but I will say this, though. If Marcion, I look at Marcion, and I've been getting digging him a lot lately. Marcion, he really, because the fact that he's the first person to put together a coherent New Testament, right? And like he and he has a lot of the letters of Paul there with, I think, Luke and Acts, I think it is, or something like that. And um, the fact that he, a Gnostic like himself, is the guy that we have to look go back to to get the first coherent New Testament, that makes me think that going that whoever he's taught by whoever going to the generation before him into the late first century, that there was a lot more wide ranging views on how, how heaven is what heaven is or how do we resurrect or if it's bodily, if it's, that's what makes me think that, that the fact that Marcion didn't subscribe to those sort of um, uh, orthodox views makes me question if, if that's where a lot of people are like Marcion. Right. Um, my again, we'll need a whole other show to do this. Yeah, sure. But my initial point is that is not true that he developed the first canon. I know like, where you're thinking that from, but a lot of the work on the intrinsic development of the canon, like we have, for example, the Mertonian fragment of the Mertonian canon, as well as like, for example, um, which did list pretty much most of what we have in the New Testament canon now, very much early in early Christianity before Marcion. We have the rule of faith who's, who's going all the way to the first century. We have uh, Sorry? Whose was that? No, the Muratonian canon. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a canon list of the step accepted books that we have. And at the end of them is where they put the books that they don't consider to be authoritative, but nonetheless instructive, like the Epistle to Barnabas, for example. So it, before, you're talking about, you're saying this is before Marcion. The Muratonian canon do, is, indicates that, yes. Okay. I'm, but I'm, in, that, in that sense, that goes back further. There's intrinsic <laughs> development. I'm seeing 180. No, exactly. So the point, I have, I'm talking about tracing the intrinsic development, right? Now that, again, is a lot, it's a much bigger question. But the refuting the Bauer thesis, I think that has been done in. Same with Arvin's argument, but... That's it. We're not really going there right now because I really got to go. So. All, right, fine, yeah. All right. Tyler, thank you so much for coming in. Right. I really, where could people find you? Uh, Twitter at Tyler Thammy, um, YouTube at Thamster. Excellent. So, guys, please follow Tyler Hamilton. I really appreciate you coming in here today. This was a fantastic discussion, different perspectives. I hope all you guys watching and gals enjoy this perspective. And once again, I'm going to uh, post this. Oh, okay. Hold on. Uh, yes. Like right now, all the people who are watching this, like this video because it helps the algorithm out. It's very important because it gets break the rules to the top of the charts. And also click the bell. I cannot stress enough. Ding, ding, ding. The bell. Here, I have a bell for you. One second. Here's the bell. Look at this bell. Look at this nice bell. Okay. This is my bell over here. Okay. C click the bell. You hear that? Whoa. It's nice, right? So click the bell and everybody will be happy. And uh, yes, yeah, so Neil, Gnostic Informant, where can people find you? YouTube.com slash Gnostic Informant. There we go. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Hold on. Why is the text not scroll scrolling? I want to make sure that we Here's get the chat Here's a few persistent in. trolls in the chat. That's quite quite amazing actually. yes oh well so. that's uh that's uh, just the order of the day okay so tyler <laughs> i know you gotta go uh i'm gonna do super chats right now but uh if you if you gotta go right now that's uh that, that's fine but i really appreciate you coming in here and uh thank you again and also people were asking about the shirt who what's the band uh conqueror, conqueror. oh there you go yeah excellent all right so there we go i'm gonna read the uh, super chats right now uh, once again, sneed those super chats and make sure that, uh, well, you know, you know what I'm talking about. See, I wrote the word super instead of searching for stream lab, uh, stream labs. <laughs> this one guy <laughs> keeps saying low T Christ God over and again. <laughs> low t like and, just over and over again. I love it. This, Neil, this is that one of, is that that one of your people, Neil? Stuff. Where? I wasn't looking. Uh, no, the, uh, no, this is, no. this has got to be some kind of, uh. Wait, okay, here we go. Okay, uh, just a couple of super chats here. TR, $5. Love the Eucharist is the marriage of the Old Testament offering of Cain and Abel, grain and fruits, fresh flesh and blood, perfected in Christ who is God. 
There we go. TR, thank you so much. And also, uh, two hours ago, the ABC, one, two, three, four, five, six, three, nine, nine, two dollars. Good evening, GeoCells. And we have Jor Salame, 150 Noakes, North uh, uh, Norway. It's $16. Not bad. Thank you so much. The lamb that is prepared is done so as a cross. One skewer pierces it from the lower parts up to the head. One across the back to the front legs. Justin Martyr about the Passover sacrifice. I don't know. That's a... Uh, well, again, the Passover sacrifice, what I don't get here is that supposedly, Neil, sa you said that the dates are... They're conflating two different things. They're conflating Passover with uh, Yom Kippur. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Okay, so RG199, Gnostic Informant won this. Well, you know what? Maybe we're going to have a poll. We're gonna have a poll on Twitter. I'm That's gonna do so it. Dumb. Yeah, go ahead though. I don't care. You can do it. Yes. Just, I'm not worried that that guy just goes into every chat and calls me names. So Who I'm, is it? I don't know. <laughs> His whole thing is like he's one of those ah Christ guys, Jew this, Jew that. That's the kind of guy he is. So ah. All right. Well, I'm gonna do a poll anyway, just because it's going to pump my own Twitter numbers. Twitter.com/slashlovepo. I always do polls on my Twitter because. I have to do more on Twitter, and here we go. You know so. what's funny is that this one guy says uh, he's equating, like, you with me. So he's, like, kvetching. It's like, bro, I'm not – like, love is, the, the, <laughs> love is the tiny hat one, not the fat one. I'm the fat one. I'm getting confused. <laughs> Holy shit. The fat one and the tiny hat one. I like the fact that it oh. rhymes. Okay, here we go. I'm going to now post the link again when I oh, do the poll. Po po yes, I one more question. Yes, one more question. Um someone asked i think it was uh another no not a well, he's a regular viewer of ours but he, we just have always disagreed uh let me find um shik's cop shit shig is cop that's the right? evolution of chicken bob first there was chicken bob and then he evolved into chicks is cop oh i yes, think the other guy that spent that's the my most twitter insulting me with Bizarre. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, he, I don't even, I don't even know you, if that's true. Doesn't say anything intelligent to save his life, but that's. What well, he, he does. said that everyone in the church disagrees with now, except like we want our base trad Christian. But anyways, he asks a better question. He says, "How come later Christians depicted Christ in artworks, even though the Bible does not explicitly give a like succinct description of Christ's facial features? How did that come about?" Well, I mean, that's a weird thing, right? I mean, you have the church, church tradition, you have it passed down about who Jesus is, who Jesus was, and whether or not they depict them in one way or the other. I mean, I don't really see what the issue there is. Do they need an exact thing? Like the the, the whole notion of icons in Catholicism, you find with saints, relics, and also, again, right. icons, is it's supposed to point you beyond the picture itself. It's supposed to point you, it's supposed to present a message from like say for example the crucifixion and the passion onto uh onto um the actual truth that it's trying to convey it's supposed to put you to the reality divine reality itself this is like this was settled in the whole iconoclast and i kind of do a controversy right mm -hmm. but the, the the picture of an icon is supposed to extend you beyond the frame into the spiritual reality that it's trying to convey right. it's not necessarily supposed to be accurate to whether or not oh he had to look a certain way he had a short have to have short hair or long hair right it's it's meant for contemplation it's meant for a prayer it's not meant for an exact literal likeness and to suspect that it would need to have a literal likeness as i think is a kind of showing you're infected with modernity a little too much you can only right. understand the ultra truth in regards to literal depictions yeah it's like the exact like the bbc lib depiction of like he was a middle eastern man or uh, he looked extra swarthy. Um, <laughs> break the skill. <laughs> that's fucking funny. I got that's a good one. Break the skill <laughs> instead of break the rules. <laughs> that's fucking good, bro. <laughs> oh, anyways, yeah, that's a good answer. So thank you, Tyler. Um, I, I personally, I don't get really hung up. I mean, there is older depictions of Christ from not necessarily icons, but from. Uh, mosaic works that are pretty similar to the later works as well so yeah mm. all right fellas that's it this was a wonderful stream i appreciate both of you being here i'm going to end the stream right now but as always subscribe 
patreon.com slash break the rules you know what you love it become a patron today and also please follow these two fantastic gentlemen on their own channels you can find the channels and the twitter and all that good stuff in the description of the video btr.ninja if you go there you're going to see all the links everywhere btr is including twitch d live uh twitter uh everywhere patreon i mean obviously patreon so anyway go there or be square i really appreciate once again everybody being here and you know me this is just me stalling for time while i'm trying to find the actual link to the uh, live streaming thing and here it is i'm pressing it right now i'm gonna end this thing Mwah! good night everybody god bless and goodbye, goodbye.